I'm Louis. Hello. Nice Hello, to Louis. meet you. I'm from the BBC. Today's guest is a hero of mine and Lawrence's. Great yeah. documentary maker. Thank you. It's Louis Thank Theroux. You. And I understand that you're in touch with celestial beings, space creatures. The whole point of the Koalinga program wasn't mm. like, let's go and hang out with some paedophiles and see what they're all about. <laughs> it was actually... That made you laugh. <laughs> he said, just for the record... Let me make it very clear. I am no longer attracted to children. That's what you would say, though. Do you know that you're not attracted to children? Yeah, that's like, good reflection. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> no. He's not going to bite me, is he? No. He's not going to bite no. my no. testicles. He was kicking off. The kids weren't going to bed. And I just just started shouting, Get into bed! Now! Wow, you're shouting really loudly. You must have really lost it. <laughs> And I felt, like, kind of ashamed. I think it's great that you admit that you lost him because you always come across in your documentaries as the calm guy. God, put it in your wicked heart. You're going to eat your babies. He's like, I'm not sure how much I can do. I've castrated myself chemically. No fucking way would I let him out. (laughs) No fucking way. There's women out there who are mad for you. The world's smallest subculture. One of it was I didn't really want to play the long game. Like, hey, should we go out on a date? I just think, hey, do you want to come back, kick back and... Smoke some ganja and, and if that didn't go I know that I can go home And, and get high And listen to some music And that would, would seem Much more appealing Who is the bitch? The baby? And he's gay for pay Is the term I, I said what, So what did you have to do? You gave the guy a blowjob? He goes like, Yeah unfortunately And, and so I it. heard myself say Oh come on You enjoyed it <laughs> Right The day after the program went out I arrived back at my house The neighbor He was quite a grumpy old man And he, and he said I see this program, and for this we pay our license (laughs) fee. It's a fascinating world, bodybuilding. Yeah. uh, Because there's, naturally, there's so many narcissistic people who jump into it. Yeah. And they want to be admired and all of that. And they're willing to basically risk their lives just to have that crappy trophy that to them means so much yeah but nobody else cares yeah and the women even more so yeah well the women are permanently damaging themselves in a different way aren't they Mm. because they're it's irreversible what they do like if a man comes off steroids it's just you know we're having more of what we already had whereas a woman their jaw their hair their facial hair all the things that are left Mm. it's irreversible their clitorises bigger clitorises yes are we rolling? When you say, when you say, that, <laughs> is that a bad irreversible element or is that a good? Ir- um, Jeez, we're getting in deep. Yeah, we're, get, we're, we're starting with bigger like, clitorises like for female clitoris bodybuilders here. On a woman, then it would be good. It's a preference, yeah. in a sense. Is well, that it, what you're saying? Well, it might, be, famously, it might be the penis. famously, um, oh, should I even say it? You know, China, the wrestler. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, she killed herself, I believe. Mm. Yeah. Or, or, or it was an overdose of sorts. An overdose. Yeah. It was it probably aged about 47 48 something like that yeah that's really sad yeah. and she was the pre preeminent um female bo- uh, wrestler at that time mm-hmm. and um did a porn film mm-hmm. with, with another wrestler actually was it was yeah it? Was that? it was x-pac who did it yeah really yeah because oh. he had a relationship with triple h who was the guy and triple h basically chose stephanie mcmahon over and had a bit of a overlap there mm. went with stephanie and then they moved China sort of out of the business slowly but surely because Stephanie McMahon owns the the, the WWE, doesn't she? So yeah. she's got that power to just see you later. And once she'd been phased out, she turned to more alcohol, more drugs. And was it? You could say she'd stopped working out as much. And when you, she was appearing on interviews really out of it, uh, like Sad. Howard Stern and places like that, you know. Um, but yeah, I remember watching, because I was like a young kid watching the WWE, and naturally you discover wrestling and porn at a similar age. Mm. So I'm like, her, she looks different. Like yeah. something different about what's going on down there when she did Playboy, you know. Well, like, I was right. going to say, so, so I stumbled on it. I don't know where on, on the, you know, you're on the web and mm. things pop up and it was a screen grab of her privates. And, and, and the point that the person who posted it was making was, wow, it's a surprisingly large clitoris. Mm. Well, it's meant to be the penis, isn't it? Or is it meant to be the end of the penis, well, the did, clitoris? If I'm meant to be. Well, okay, you, know, I, you know, before you, I, so before, before, you, yeah, go before you go one way or the other, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, 
It's yeah. It's that's a, a, that's penis. apparently why we've got a, that dotted line between our arse and our testicles. Could be a vagina. Is it what that was? What would have been the vagina? I'd have had a very pretty vagina. Post fertilization, there's a fork in the road. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and and the embryo can go a few different ways. Sorry, I was going to say what? a couple of different ways, but that would be that would be a close-minded in a modern like age. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Sorry, I forgot to do the intro. Uh, welcome back to the True Jordy Podcast. <laughs> Sponsored. Yeah, like, you use it the side going, shocks. Um, shocks. Yeah, Jim. baby shock. Yeah. Um, uh, welcome back to the True Jody podcast, sponsored by Jim Shark. And today's guest is a hero of mine and Lawrence's. It's Louis oh, Theroux, you. great yeah. documentary maker. Thank you. And, uh, great yeah. journalist, I think, is actually. Um, yeah. Well, what yeah, that's well, what, what we should say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying I am both, but I, both those professional mm. terms are acceptable. Mm. Great podcaster uh, is very kind of you to say, and like an occasional podcaster. Oh, yeah, yeah. you ever started. thought about giving yourself an easier ride, just jumping into the podcast because then, because it's it's we've made a, a few documentaries before, and it's so much work mm -hmm. by comparison oh my God, to having a, a conversation with someone. And also, you have the the following, and you see what people like Joe Rogan are doing out there. You could make a lot of money doing a bit of an easier life for yourself. So here's me thinking I've turned up for a, a podcast interview and it's so actually a business I'm meeting. Pitching it. Yeah, sorry, Louis. What I we want it. is we want to do a three-way me, podcast with you every week. Or a new financial manager. We will yeah. produce you, no problem. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a it's it has struck me having done uh, twenty episodes of a podcast mm. called Grounded, which is still available available on BBC Sounds. Giving myself a little plug, and it that, that it was surprisingly easy. And in my book, uh, I talk about wow, this feels weird. Um, how kind of, sort of relatively straightforward it is just to record this thing mm -hmm. because I was doing it remotely. I didn't people didn't even have to show up. Exactly, my guests were just doing it from their homes, mm -hmm. and um, and then you put it out there, and then tons of people would would re I, got, I got more feedback on my podcast than I did for any TV I'd made for the previous well, like, at least for the previous five or six years is that not because it's easier to give that feedback because of the formats of podcasting whereas it's like, also the fact you have fucking KSI on the podcast because you can get loads of feedback is there a dog that's just yeah sorry, yeah, sorry Biggie get hilarious. the bed will you um, so yeah you had that was Brian stroking my leg oh, sorry about that yeah. <laughs> yeah he's got very long legs very long legs <laughs> um, uh, yeah you had our friend KSI on your podcast what do you yeah. make of the new wave of celebrities now because obviously you went around talking uh, all of the celebrities uh, you know when you were on the come up but now we're met with a completely different kind of celebrity people who just have made, be, become famous from talking to the yeah, camera. I think it's extraordinary. And full disclosure, I first became aware of KSI because my kids, who are now 15 and 13, but probably this would have been a couple of years ago, told me, kept saying, um, KSI's fighting Logan Paul, mm. which, which would, as a sentence, meant nothing to me. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? The, the proper nouns, mm. I, didn't, I didn't recognize. Like, what is that? What, who, and why would they express interest in a boxing match anyway? That was out of character for them. And then it turned out they were YouTubers. So fast forward a few years, basically I realized there was this world of um, people, self-created personalities mm -hmm. who were completely outside the realm of normal media, just uh, existing through their own channels, coming up from their bedrooms. And that was, and, and I dug into it. To be honest, it took me a few uh, watches to get it. Like you, you don't sort of dip into one KSI video and sort of think, oh, I, I get why billions of people mm -hmm. are, are, are locking onto this. Because actually, a, a, a lot of it is, it is almost by definition homemade. And, and, and it takes a while to appreciate what it is that the kids are kind of getting about it. But I, I, want, I had him on the podcast because I wanted to reflect this new world of, of YouTubers and internet people. And I think it's, extra, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Because it feels to me that, the, that um, for the younger, younger crowd, kids, you know, teenagers, it's almost like they are they're rock stars you know they represent for them something that they own like that that generation is special for them is meaningful for them it, same, same as what punk rock would have been back right, in the day for right, example right yeah. we didn't we, for, for me it would have probably been rappers because mm. I, I thought like mainstream rock or even indie rock felt a bit square to me so mm. the world of rappers and the feuds between rappers and actually there's an interesting parallel because it was the authenticity that I responded to in the and East Coast, West Coast beef, right? And the idea of, oh, Dre's fallen out with Ice Cube now. And actually, uh, you know, now Tupac and Biggie are, are beefing. And, 
and, and, and it sort of felt like a soap opera, but also it spoke to a kind of community that one aspired to be part of and that you felt that maybe you, you were kind of hanging out with these older guys who were mm. cool, bit risky, uh, quite funny, but very talented. And That's think, our podcast. There you go. The YouTubers are sort mm. of, are, well, we hope so, right? People can decide at the end yeah. of this episode. Um, you know, you felt like um, th- th- that's what the, ki- the kids are into now. Is that, is that feeling of um, authenticity? I hate saying like that's what the kids no, but, are into. I, but I feel like I sound like an old Radio well, yeah. 1 DJ. No, don't worry. Yeah, no, you're, you're talking, definitely not. You're, you're spot on because it's people being themselves and uh, in, in the world that you came up in, you probably were very fortunate to get that break which now people are sort of engineering their own breaks. You know, as you know, we've been filming with KSI mm. for, uh, for a documentary for Amazon, and I've seen some of the rushes and the response he gets from his fans um, at, at, at the festivals is extra- and just shows in general, it's extraordinary. Mm-hmm. It's like Beatlemania. It is, mm. yeah. It, it, Crying. You know, I've been to a lot of gigs, but the hysteria. level of hysteria yeah. um, is, is off the charts, which I think it speaks to what you're talking about, right? And what, we have been, what we've been talking about, which is people feel such an, a, a kind of a, a kinship mm. with, um, with... They've watched YouTubers. him grow up, yeah. and you can't we have. quite compare that to, you know, let's say a, a huge superstar like Eminem mm. in my generation was the guy. Of course. Uh, but I heard an album from him every other year, say. Yeah. And But the connection, if, I, if I'd been able to watch his life every day, it would have been even more intense. It would have been even more like fandom. And that's what he, they have now got that direct line to their audience. It's amazing. Just a little subject change. So I'm just wondering like, where, what are you into at the moment? What is your thing? How do you relax of a of an evening? You know, whatever's big in the culture, TV wise, uh-huh. like I, I'm t- I tend to give it give a go. Like obviously, Squid Game was huge recently. Yeah. Succession, uh, Succession. I binged the second. Well, no, it's the third. It was third, the third season. season. What did you make of Squid Game out of interest? Did you like uh, it? I found it very compelling. Like the first couple, I was like, this isn't for me. You like it, it, it has a sort of Korean acting style. Or I don't know what, what you'd call it, but you know how like I call it bad. Like but, different yeah. cultures have different sort of distinct, yeah. kind of, uh, almost like I don't know acting styles, and like you're slightly exaggerated. Right. But then by the third one, I was like, okay, this is pretty good. And then and then I went I went with it and I enjoyed it a lot. Did you not like it? Uh, I like the concept yeah. and and some of the things that it made you consider. But like the acting was a bit WWE wrestling. Do you think that, like, then it got better? When then there were different that. tonalities later on, and uh, did you make it as far as the marbles yeah, episode? I, I watched the whole thing. Yeah. So the marble that there was some very um, affecting, like the bit where he's playing marbles with the guy who, who's got dementia, hmm. Hmm. and then I thought that was really powerful, like some terrific, sort of dramatic. Um, yeah, that was a, a powerful moment for sure. So watching TV, cooking is my other one. Oh, really? Yeah, I love to cook. And what dr- are you cooking now? Because oh. you talk a lot about spaghetti and um, ke- keder- keder- well, keder- No, I talk more, well... Bolognese is what you talk about well, in your no, book. Well, no, lasagna. Sorry, that is what, right. veggie lasagna as well, yeah. Yeah, veggie lasagna. Anything that requires me to be in the kitchen uh, where I can therefore be on my own for a bit, like, it's, you know, have a little break from the family, and then have a couple of drinks, listen to either a podcast uh, or what, some, what kind of drink? Just, I'm trying to get an idea so, of where you are here. Well, what are I you talk, drinking, gin and tonic? I, so just, to, the elephant in the room is that I've got a book out, and I talk about a lot of this stuff, and it's called Through the Keyhole, and it's a very, what's and all, candid. I read, I read it all, it's fantastic. There we go, a candid, and, and, re, and it's almost revealing to the point, being slightly self-flagellating, look at a, a family man in his 50s being me, who, who's possibly on the edge of having a drinking problem. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh when I say that. Nah, that's fine. And you know, yeah, going through the pandemic and going slowly insane. I think we all are. As we all were, and actually, and, and being a kind of, whatever the opposite of an exemplary dad is, like a disastrous dad mm. in many respects. And a lot of it takes place in the kitchen where I'm making lasagnas to just escape from my three children and, have, and be able to sort of drink unobserved, right? Let's get a few, like, not, and it would be... Um, so it's almost sneaking them in. Mm. Sneak sounds loaded, but yes, <laughs> but yes. Well, that's why cocktails There's are quite good. There's a scene in the book where I talk about hiding my t- 
this isn't my coming out as an alcoholic. But yeah. there's, I talk about for hide- the title purposes, it will be. But yeah, yeah. Louis through alcohol. I do yeah. not have a problem. Yeah, you exactly. Can yes. You can do that. The Daily Mail will do it. What, that the, way. The, the, what they do is they use the pull quote. The pull quote would be, "This isn't my coming out as an alcoholic." Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Louis Louis through in denial. I must admit, when yeah. I watch the uh, Place for Pedos uh, documentary, and one of them goes, "I am no longer attracted to children." <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm like, huh? That's that's what you would say though. Yeah. That's what that okay. is. Actually, okay. just speaking of cocktail moments, that's actually one of my favourite moments you've ever had in a documentary. And I yeah. wanted to know whether Mr. Uh, Kitchens was his name. He said, just for the record, let me make it very clear, I am no longer attracted to children. Yeah. But <laughs> no, that's not no, my favourite moment in that documentary. And then he, goes, he also goes to be like, How do you know if you are attracted to children? Do you know that you're not attracted to children? Yeah, that's like, good reflection. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you mention it. The, the best bit in that documentary is when you go in and you they're having the party and the guy's mixing the drink and you go yeah. over to him and he say, and you say, what are you in for? He gets me to taste his lemonade, right. first of all, which yeah. is a nice icebreaker. Uh, yeah. And then in the way that, you know, there's certain opening lines that, like if you're a casino, the opening line, instead of saying hello, you go like, how are you doing? Are you winning? Are mm-hmm. you winning? Are you up? Uh, are you up? Are you? And then in 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 a prison, you go like, "What are you in for?" And then it, also in a, as it turns out, maximum security hospital for pedophiles and sex offenders. What are you in for? And he, do you remember what he says? He says um, along the lines of, uh, "I'm in for date rape." Yeah, he says Wh- date rape, yeah. which is, and I I couldn't work out if in that moment because there's times in the documentary we were talking about where sometimes you see your eyes go brilliant we got the clip sort of thing uh I, with that was that a moment where well, that's went, how we interpret it well that's just how we interpret clear, it you might be thinking oh that's interesting but we we want the juice you might think you're fucking poker face but we've got you sussed yeah. is what we're saying yeah but in that moment did you sort of go well that's fantastic uh you know i, I may have done i i can neither confirm nor deny right. it wasn't like there were many moments on that um shoot where i was like this is extraordinary there was another when they um do you remember at the same party, it was a Halloween party, and, and the singing contingent, there's a, a choir at the, uh, the hospital, and they, they decide to sing the Adams Family I, theme. Yeah, fucking hell. I'm creepy and I'm okay, <laughs> I'm monstrous and I'm okay, whatever. The thing is, the, the crazy thing about that guy, the, the alleged date rape guy, is he... You say alleged even now. You, well, right. here's my point, is that I would strongly suspect it was something uh, worse than date rape. That was him kind of dialing it down like, they all did, I've got to probably. say something that doesn't sound wildly yeah. like uh, 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 like he's not he's not he's obviously not in there for postage fraud right mm. but um well, he might also be you don't end up at Koalinga um <laughs> for a, for a single date rape right you've got to have two index offenses and and by the way the t- as I'm sure you know the term date rape is um considered offensive you know it's like oh well it was a date and it went wrong it gives the wrong impression he was undoubtedly in there for a violent um a, a violent sex crime yeah uh, and, so, and, so and they all say alleged yeah it was i think it was worse than what uh, right saying. i see what you're saying you're not trying to dial it down you're <laughs> no. actually yeah you're giving him more credit than he deserves there, there was one conversation that stuck out in in my head from that one is where <laughs> you asked the guy was was that the one where um your son wank you off for example and and he's like no no that never happened he goes Oh man, I, <laughs> I wanked off and he was just there. Right, yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah. And I was like, easy mistake to make. That's not funny. Surely. It's no, not no, funny, but, one, but that same guy, he was, I can't, his name was Mr. Yarn. Uh-huh. You had to call him Mr. It was yeah. one of the rules. One of the strange places about that, um, the strange things about that place was that um, because they were uh, patients, not prisoners, they, they were, they, you know, it was a requirement of the, of the hospital that they extend certain courtesies, mm. right? They weren't there to be punished. They were there to be m- kind of medically reformed. And so they couldn't, you know, so one of the things they're like, well, even the term patient, they said, well, we prefer that. We think that term is a bit demeaning. So I said, what do you call them? So we call them our residents. And, um, and we always address them as Mr. So then I just got into the habit. Is, isn't that, See what I mean like, about the accent? Isn't though, that the bullshit though, really? Like they're, 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 <laughs> they're trying to nicey nicey something that isn't nice at all. And the problem is, is their attraction makes them a permanent danger for the rest of their lives to uh, what the rest of society holds dearest, which is their children. And then, you know, they're all dialing it down and claiming, oh, I'm not, I'm not in for that bad a thing and we can reform these people. You can't reform them. This the is whole, why he's making the docs and you're... No, but in my head, I'm, yeah. I'm watching, thinking, how the, none of these guys come across as anywhere near reformed. Even the ones you're about to release, I'm thinking, no fucking way would I let him out. <laughs> no fucking way. Uh, I, you should take mine to your next it's one. In a sense, the, um, the hospital is a... Um, 
how, what's the best way of putting it? Like, I think it's, it's a de facto warehouse in the sense that very few people leave. Um, the, 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 the no, more people get out on legal appeals mm. than get out having graduated from the, what they call the phase program of, of rehabilitation. <laughs> I think rehabilitation. One, well, like one a year. Yeah. I mean, that's not an act. I, I remember when I was there and it had been going about seven years, they'd had about 10, uh, something like that, wow. actually leave. And I think the, the problem is, is you can't coerce people into therapy. Like they, they're there thinking like, I'm not here to be released. I'm here to be just kept behind. You know, I've done two prison terms uh, and then the, the authorities have like, we can't fucking let that guy out. What are we going to do? Like, okay, why don't we have this law called civil commitment? And it's a bit like a section where we say mm. your dangerousness as a paedophile m- means that you're mentally ill. Mm-hmm. Now, by many other metrics, they wouldn't be considered mentally ill. Like they're not, they don't experience any kind of psychosis. Uh, they, they, they in, in, in most respects, other than being deviant sex offenders function, right? They're functional. They can keep jobs down. Yeah. Right. Uh, if they try to use that, for example, as a plea of insanity, they, they'd never get it. No, they, exactly. It, for that reason. So, but, but for the purposes of keeping them behind yeah. some kind of uh, Protective security class. facility, yeah. they, they are deemed to be kind of medically unsound. And the legal term is sexually violent predator. And so they're, they're, they're put away. And, 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 then, and then the uptake of the therapy is, is extremely low. Like it's only a small, a relatively small minority of people yeah. that take part but, in the therapy. So mm. like for the others, they're just going around playing squash, making lemonade, <laughs> do, singing the Adams Family theme. Did, that was quite interesting. But I, c- can I ask you one question about when you were interviewing one guy, it came across like, so he was going, oh, the therapy and action speak louder than words. And I was watching him yeah, like- It was Mr. Land. Yeah, th- this guy, you could almost feel a bit sorry for him right. because I wasn't, when I was watching his interview, I wasn't aware of what he'd done. I think, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I was uh, paying enough attention or if it had been clarified yet. But the point was, is he was coming across so compelling in his... Well, he spoke with a kind of exaggerated courtesy. Like he was deferential and it was like, he was, he, he was, his affect, he was like, oh yes, well, one wonders if, well, he was, he's doing, he was actually, when I first met him, he was making a, a, a Ferris wheel out of bits of card for kids like a kids craft project sure and then he was spinning it around saying like well w- when the wheel does spin it, it, it reassures one somewhat that one has done it correctly which is rather a good feeling and so he had this sort of punctilious way of almost like um, I, I don't know how to describe it like like a, a waiter at a really posh restaurant yeah. that's, or, 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 or a it was flight, disarming and reassuring at the same attendant time in right. first, yeah. you ever have a flown first class and the flight attendants no they're so sort of like almost like um, att- attentive that it's faintly like it p- makes me quite tense. Right? Yeah, I, like, I have yeah. to reflect back your level of attentiveness, and then I'm oh yes, thank you ever so much. Do you know what I mean? But the yeah, po- the I point of it is to relax <laughs> yeah. you, but because you can feel you're trying to relax me, your brain goes, "I'm not relaxed." This now. is extremely tense yeah. now. Yeah, I have that. He's on we- first class, feeling really tense. E- even when you get to business, there's a level of tension. But I imagine in first class, it's like really tense. Oh my god! But you, I think, but if you're like. Um, I don't know, like Rupert Murdoch or, or Richard. You're probably you, you're like, yeah, bring me another one. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, you don't give a this shit. This time, though. don't stin, you know, a little yeah. more vodka. Mm. But if you're like, if you're like us, and you're, you're sort of trying to be a decent person, you think, like, oh, I better give back what they're giving to me. I was once in. It doesn't happen often, but I've been upgraded a few times. And once, you know, they like, oh, we like your programs. We think we can make you a little more comfortable. So they bring me up into like business or first, and they lay you out like on a full, like a full, like a flat bed, like a f- which is the dream. On a long flight, you get mm. a flat bed. And they are, you, these are you new- too big for the bed, or are you? No, they're no. about six. They are. A li- I'm six feet two and a half, and they're about that. They're, right. It's like just Perfect. right. Yeah. So, um, so then they they, they they had these new beds, and they're like so pleased to show them off. And like oh, there I am lying. Like, I know we can tuck you in. Would you like me to take out the duvet, sir? Oh, that would be great. We'll tuck you in. And then like eight hours fly by, and then we're coming into land. And I don't know if it was what well, I I'd done something wrong, and I was like. I, I was having trouble, you know, like sometimes it's quite confusing operating, yeah. like the, the buttons and levers on on a, on, a, on a plane. And then I'm like, oh, do I release it? So I'm still lying down. That's so I hit my flight attendant's button. And I say like, I, I can't make it go back to a seat. So then they're like, oh, oh, so sorry, sir. Oh, just be one minute. And then they're leaning over me. And then I don't, I think I'd broken the fucking lever or the button. So then they're like levering it. And, and then this, this, he gets his mate. So then there's two or three of them grunting <laughs> around you. Like, 
bending over me and I'm there like a pain I'm becoming an operation like, oh, it should grip over me oh, it pull it oh, no I don't know so I'm so sorry I hope it wasn't something I did oh, it just pull over me oh. and then they're like they can't fix it and they're like oh, oh, sorry so you're going to have to come into land <laughs> lying down I don't even know if that's legal I don't think that but is I'm, so I'm feeling awful like I, they, they upgraded me I broke their bed and now here I am looking like a total pranit coming to land at Heathrow <laughs> lying down with my seat people belt people walking on. past going that Louis right. Theroux thinks he's a boss <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly everyone's filing class. off the plane <laughs> and then I'm there still lying down like, like a, a mental health like patient who's <laughs> been locked into his <laughs> bed yeah. he's been strapped in. <laughs> strapped down so yeah. going, going yeah, back to that guy episode. though he was um, my question basically was were you like look this isn't therapy this isn't work and you're just trying to say whatever you need to say to get the hell out of here and it's I said so I, you know what I had a little sh showdown with him in the last scene of the film where I was like I'd, I'd actually r r read his clinical notes uh, at that point like the first time I met him I hadn't read his clinical notes it was only two days in to the shoot I was realised oh we're allowed to read their clinical notes mm, they, wow. so the first couple of interviews I did with some of the contributors um uh, I, I hadn't read them. I, I don't. Clinical notes might not be the right term, but whatever. I had more background on what he'd done, and then I, I, I realised for the first time that he had two daughters. He'd been married, and that part of his grooming process had been getting his daughter's friends over and and putting them in the bath, and that that would lead to the him abusing them. That was a preamble to his abuse. And you know, when you read, um, you know, I, I'm very much I t take people as I find them. Like it's part of my process in a way to sort of arrive in a space and and try and size someone up and figure out based on how they re react with me and how they behave, like what I make of them and see, you know, and call them on stuff that I've seen. I try not to dredge up stuff too much, but clearly, if you're talking to a criminal or 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 or, or a paedophile. You know, they can come across very plausible. And what you realize is that you really need, you, you, you absolutely have to be briefed. And so two days in, I had more information. I realized what his offense pattern was. And he, I thought he'd been very open. In some respects, he had. He told me, like, oh, I have 54 offenses, mostly involving boys in their teens. Like, those weren't convictions. Those were things that he'd revealed in therapy, which is another reason they don't do therapy, a lot of them, by the way, is because it can lead to new cases. Mm -hmm. Because you're supposed to be open in therapy. Like, And actually, if you've been convicted on three counts of this involving two boys, but actually you've abused 50 boys, right? Then they're thinking, like, why, why on earth would I disclose that in mm. therapy when that could be used against me in a future case? Anyway, you're in for life anyway, though. So you uh, well. not technically, because he's not there on a conviction. He's there on a medical right. for a medical rehabilitation right. that he could come out on, at, in theory, at any time. And in fact, anyway, he. So I challenged him on his offences a bit more robustly, and he got crossed. Like you saw his um, whatever sense of vanity and narcissism, like behind his accentuated uh, sort of humili humility was a kind of a, 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 a sort of a narcissism and, 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 and he, he, I put his back up a bit and he got, he got annoyed and I think you saw a bit more of, of the real person. He's like, I'm not sure how much I can do. I've been, hold, let, hear me out on this. I've been in here for five years. I've castrated myself chemically in order to, which gone beyond what was required of me. I have made account of, of everything that I've done. So I feel that, and then his therapist was there and she was, she was sort of giving me the evils like, what would you expect Mr. Lamb to do in your in your um, words to own up to what he's done? Like, what would you expect from him? So then I'm, I mean, in a, in a sense, um, I felt a little bit bad for him because I was mm -hmm. just, it, it, there was a part of it that was just creating a moment for television. Like, I was conscious that I need to be seen to... Um, give this guy a little bit of a of a grilling, mm -hmm. and then he's sort of obviously upset and reacting badly. To give you the and then last year I made four series, uh, four episodes of a follow up show about various things. I followed up on him. He was one of the people I got back in touch with. Oh wow! And he had been released uh, about three years after I was there, and then um, fell afoul of the process. I don't think he'd done any new crimes, but I think he'd he'd failed to register and. I think they'd intercepted some 
mail for him that they felt was inappropriate. And he, he was back. I, I can't remember if he was back. In, he was back behind. Get caught, by the way. Like, you know, you've got the internet there and you're getting mail sent to you. Like, that's, Let's yeah. not give them a... a I think I, he was in jail. Please. He was in jail on something. <clears throat> uh, having failed to register, he said my car broke down or something. Then he sent a letter. They intercepted the letter. Anyway, bottom line, he's back. All, all the guys who were doing really well in therapy, it was Mr. Allegedly. Lamb and the alleged, and, and Mr. Rigby was another. Mr. Rigby was back in prison on a new case. Oh, like wrong. He'd, he'd molested. There was one guy who you seen had an inappropriate picture that in was his Mr. room. No not, one, no, not one inappropriate picture, yeah. like a series of inappropriate but, pictures but, where he went, I wouldn't, this, this is one of the best bits because you've got his caseworker there at that time. Yes. And they go, and you go, would you say that? Does he look like he's a teenager or is he not a teenager? And he's like, well, he looks old enough to me. Yeah. And, I'm so, and you're sort of in this gray area. And then even the caseworker seems to want to back him and yeah. sort of go, well, he looks he looks fairly adult he to me. He seems to be of, of age. Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah, that was a. The thing is, is I mean, we could talk about Koalinga. That's the name of the place for the whole podcast. But because it's one of the most extraordinary. People say, "What's the weirdest place you've ever been?" In a sense, Koalinga is it because of the collision of the, the the sort of the dangerous psychological profile of the people who are there, but also the weirdness of the institution itself. Mm. Right? You know, it's, mental health processes. Many of them are imperfect at best, which isn't to say. You know, a lot of it doesn't work, but a lot of it is, is, is um, you know, inexact. You know what I mean? We don't understand. The brain is mysterious. And the idea of curing people, like whether it's medication or therapy, or these are all, to some extent, still being figured out. And when you're talking about a, a, a dangerous, like an ingrained um, bu abu groomer and abuser of children, and then you're attempting to use sort of uh, AA-style therapy or group counseling therapy uh, to, to address that, it's really kind of putting a plaster on a gaping wound. I think. And, and also having them all together, mm -hmm. to me, normalizes so much of what they've all done when they're talking. There was one guy who went, yeah, I think most of us in here are, they, he had like a- um, Yeah, that's the problem. A Spanish look to him, uh, like a, a gangster uh, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, I think most of us are sane here. And I'm <clears throat> watching that thing, and you, that's because you are all together going, what are you in for? And it's becoming like, ah, it's not a big deal. Right, but point, but he, had yeah. a, he has a point in a way, like, in a sense, like, he's saying, like, we've committed crimes, but we're not mentally Yeah, he was Ill. right in that sense, it, So, So in a way, it's sort of like, um, his point is, um, uh, we're being held for future crimes. Like, we're being <sighs> held for crimes that we may commit in the future, but we've all done our terms, we've done our pr probation and our parole. Uh -huh. And, and like, until we commit another crime, who are you to say that we're mentally ill? And then, well, they would say, well, uh, two psychologists have deemed you to be medic, you know, da like dangerous. Mm. But it, it, it is a kind, it's, it's a slightly awkward, because most paraphilias, which is what paedophilia is, like, you know, people who have sex with cars, people have sex with vending machines, mm. right? People dress but up. Those, they're not left with. They're not left with. Um, it's, the car isn't left with a terrible memory. No, they're not. The car yeah. is not traumatized. Mm. No, <laughs> you'd hope not. Although unless you might need a new exhaust. Unless it's kit, at which point you know. Right. So as yeah. a society, we've made the decision rightly that those those um, paraphilias that leave victims in their wake are treated more 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 severely or more seriously. But in in strictly medical terms. Um, it's not actually uh, a, a mental illness. Are they not just being kind to them? Because that's what I kind of thought when you made that point. I was a bit like, listen, they're being quite kind to you here. They could have put you in an institution where there was no chance for rehabilitation. They could have put you in an in in institution and basically gone, lock them up and throw away the no, key. No, but they could, legally they couldn't. But they could. But the, the legal system could just do that. And they could just say they pedophiles. They could change the, the yeah, sentences. They basically, would... pedophiles are so dangerous that there is no way to re rehabilitate them. But the, well, there they is. Could, but those laws, I mean, they'd have to pass a whole new set of laws. They're working with in the laws that exist. But he was sort of arguing, and I get what you're saying, but it, what I mean is the system could just go, these people don't deserve a second chance. And actually it's as bad as murder. You've, you've taken away someone's happiness for 20, 30 years of their life. That's as bad as murder, which a lot of people probably would regard it as that. We'll lock you up and throw away the key. I'm not necessarily making the case for that, but I mean, he's then sort of taking the piss by going, well, is it really that bad? And you sort of say in your book, I think, a lot of them kind of justify it by speaking about things like things from ancient Greece and things like That's that. Right. And they try and find ways of um, normalizing, normalizing it. Yeah. it. Yeah. No, uh, well, here, so, so what, what I think people were faced with, like the, the authorities were faced with, was the fact that historically um, sentences for child abuse and paedophilia were like relatively low, certainly by today's standards. So we're talking about, I think, uh, 
those people, that most of the people at Coalinga were quite old. Like it was rare to see anyone under 50. Most were in their 60s, 70s and 80s. And um, so they are people who've done things that they would have done a lot more time. Like they can pass all the laws they want now. And I think many of those laws have been passed. But um, they were dealing with people who were coming out of prison now. And they had people that they wanted to lock up now. And they needed a legal framework to do it. The other thing, though, is... The cost of keeping them there in those medical facilities is enormous. Right. Like it's it's more it's over a hundred thousand. I think you said two hundred grand a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah two hundred grand a year per guy with like seven hundred in that one. I mean, it's Jesus. it's millions, and um, some business. of them are in their eighties and and nineties, right? Mm. I mean, so it's a just dog. I mean, and actually, <laughs> um, there we go. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I forgot, I forgot where that lady right, came yeah. from. Yeah. I, and so they, they are. Do you think people will your audience get the reference? No, oh, that, that was a Jimmy that Savile was a total in, innocent reference. R- really, was it though? But then yeah. you know when you've watched something, and because obviously I've been watching all of your stuff, yeah. things just creep into your brain. Absolutely. Um, actually, I wanted to talk to you about your drink problem more. Okay. Uh, what is your uh, drink no, of well, choice well, when you're borderline cre- drink problem? Borderline yeah. drink problem. Because well, well, you sort of have so a similar about, issue, don't you? Yeah, I just like whiskey. Right. My, that was my other thing. I was going to say that. So w- w- during the pandemic, mm. I was drinking uh, bourbon, mm. Kentucky bourbon. Good choice. And, and, and I got into something called Bullet, which an American friend had introduced me to. It's not expensive. It's, it's a relatively, like, you, fi- you may find, uh, they sell it in my co-op mm. uh, where, where I live in Northwest London. You're really selling it. I mean, uh, they don't, I, I worry, like, actually a little part of me is like, I'm talking about Bullet a lot in my book. I wonder if they'll send me like some free bullet, but I almost prefer that they didn't, so I can keep a, dis- a kind of dispassionate distance from yeah. it. Because, because actually, um, Christmas was- is bad for that, isn't it? Where you just get everyone gets you whiskey, alcohol, yeah, you like yeah. And so I was, you know, if I have, I actually, I was going to say, if I had bullet in the house, I'm having a dry January, okay, good for you. So I'm feeling quite smug. I'm two days in. I, I didn't start bank. Monday was a bank holiday, so I. I, I oh, you can't I start on a bank around. holiday. No, that's the way yeah. it works. but where are we on Thursday? So Tuesday, Wednesday. I, I haven't had anything to drink and I've got some bourbon in the house but typically like, if I had bourbon in the house I'm like, I'm like fuck it I'm going to have some how many glasses of whiskey can you get through in a night and still be like I don't know what was the most for you where you're just like I oh. don't really keep tabs but um, wow you, you know, really are gone in the book there's several times when I um, I talk I don't use the term uh, blackout but there were several times when I would wake up uh on the sofa or uh, on the spare bed and, and not quite remembering yeah. the last couple of hours. Yeah. Like, it, for some reason, January 6th, the night of the insurrection, I got mullered. Um, <laughs> I think there was a lot going on, you know, and, yeah. and a, a, part, a lot of the people involved in, the, you know, what was going on at the White House um, were people that we'd been, not a lot, some of them were people we'd been in touch with for documentaries and had been in the process of making a documentary about... Um, you know, members of the far right groups, and I was still thinking, this is so weird. What's going on over there? And 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 also, I just so I, I had a couple like all of us. It's hard to reconstruct. I mean, it was only like was it a Tuesday night? It wasn't like a, it was a week night. Mm. And um, and I remember I'd also had heard that Oliver Stone had heard a podcast that I did that he was in. Like he'd listened to and he'd, he'd said something really nice about mm. it. And then I'd listened to. A, thing I'd done with FKA Twigs a rough cut and I was like that sounds good like a few little things had happened that made me happy ah uh, that gets you going and then I was like I have a I've drink and have another and then a I was reward. watching Edinburgh on TV and yeah. I was watching this frog freezing and I remember that this is this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen on television like the frog is freezing but it's still alive and then you saw it defrost like like a block, like a block of ice and then became like ribbit ribbit came back to and I thought I thought this is the most extraordinary thing I've ever been on, seen on TV. And then I had a couple more drinks. But your question was how much? I don't know. Quite a lot though. Yeah, Quite you're a big a guy as well. I think us big guys we can we can Not put it away. Mm. Uh, I love the fact that you are watching Attenborough because yeah. to me you two are like you make different stuff, but yeah. you are the two best known documentary makers in the world. Well, it's not nice document. to be considered in the same breath. I, I, one of the proudest moments, almost some more and most surreal moments of my career was a few years ago when I, we, I, was, pl- I was asked to plug things for, a, I think it was a new app or a new platform, or maybe it was just an iPlayer push. And they're like, talk about things that you liked on TV that are on iPlayer. And I can't, I think I mentioned uh, probably uh, League of Gentlemen and uh, you know one or two other things. And um, uh, and I and then they showed me the Attenborough one, and he said, "Yes, I enjoy the young Mister Theroux," 
And, and, and it was like the idea of, of being um, given a seal of approval by him. Uh, you sure he didn't mean Justin through for what he's done in Hollywood? Mm. Well, you know, until you said that, but he's, I don't think he's on the iPlayer. <laughs> That's a good no, point. No, yeah, yeah, I get no, that. You've yeah, got him yeah, on yeah, that one. Yeah, few. But you Gosh. also... You, no, that, can I just sorry. say, though? That's unbelievable. That, like, isn't for it? you, as, yeah. as, 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 he's the godfather of the, the game, isn't he? So, he's, he's the Don. Yeah. I mean, he is Il Capo di Tutti Capo. Yeah, every time Again, he trends... Again, another great reference. Yeah. Every time he trends, people are terrified that anything's happening because obviously he's getting to an older age and yeah. we were, we're just like, not him. Yeah. He's the best. That yeah. is kind of... The, I think that's Twitter's biggest uh, they're, they're basically they must be prepping for that day at twitter mm. just lining servers up for tweets about david attenborough mm. when he finally does you know pass on to the next yeah natural world what kind of music are you into louis i you know a bit of everything i would say almost everything like i listen to a lot of at the moment grime and drill because really yeah because my because <laughs> of your kids i like, love mainly, it mainly because my kids if i were in the car they insist on... Um, is there one artist in particular? Uh, well, AJ Tracy, I okay, like. Great. Good choice. Central C. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, Central C seems to be kind of you know, sort of blowing up right now. Um, who, who are the other, like, <laughs> yes. Some of the white guys like H and yeah, yeah. Uh, RD. Yeah. RD's got a collab with um, Central C at the moment, I think. Were you, was this, do you think it also stems like from real you? life music, factual pain music. Do you mean, so did you, you like hip hop back in the day? Yes, I did. Yeah. It's hard to keep up because artists, the turnover of artists in the rap and hip hop world is, is quite fast. Yeah. Much higher now. But, well, back in the, like in the, uh, you could almost say it's, it's lower now in the sense that when I was coming up in, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, the golden age of hip hop and there were artists uh, like, uh, I mean, EPMD, uh, D, people you may not even know, D Nice. I don't uh, D Nice, yeah. Uh, uh, BDP, uh, which was KRS One, but Big Daddy, K- Big Daddy Kane had. Borderline. That, yeah, VPD, but mm-hmm. similar. The, the Big Daddy Kane had like two extraordinary albums. He had a third that was so so, and then I think a fourth that was dreadful. Even like the, 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 the kind of premier uh, MC of, 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 the t- of the time, Eric B. Uh, oh, and, and Rakim. Rakim, yeah, yeah, and, 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 paid in and, full. And Rakim's um, Rakim's uh, flow royalty. was extraordinary, and it was yeah. royalty. And he had like three really strong albums, but then he fell off. Mm. And it was almost like that was the. It was like you only really in this world you only really get to be the big man for a couple of years. How did you? But then later, just to right. go, but then later it felt like oh well, someone like um, I I don't know if it was. Uh, NWA that changed the template because they like someone like Ice Cube stuck around mm. and then Jay Z stuck around and then no, it's like oh no oh now you can be like rock stars like the ro- now you can be like the Rolling Stones yeah Snoop Dogg and all of them and you can and Snoop yeah, Dogg forever. and they're still they're forever artists yeah. but that's not still Dre yeah still Dre uh, did you watch the um the um the Defiant ones no I I mean to watch it oh you'd love that yeah I would love God. it I would love it yeah. I was too busy drinking bourbon in the kitchen I spent two years sort of not watching. As, well, it sounds a bit weird, but not watching as many docs as I would like, uh-huh. more or less because I didn't. I was sort of, it was hand to mouth in a sense. In the you know, with, with respect to just domestic chores, work commitments, parenting, and then the only TV I could watch was stuff that involved the family, and yeah. I, I, can't, I can't always get them to sign up to a documentary. Uh, so this yeah. the, the COVID situation, lockdowns, all of that. <clears throat> One of my mates who's got three kids basically said to me. It was driving him insane, mm. being surrounded by like he's like I love them, but I can't fucking do this. Like it's doing yeah. my head in now. And you drinking and stuff like that, yeah. and telling us how you are. Like how was it for you just going through that time? And and also how are you feeling about the world right now? Yeah, uh, because it's it seems weird. Like we were kind of told get the uh, get the vaccine and we'll all be okay to get back to normal and now we're like still have this sort of thing hanging over us as a society how is it making you feel well the, to the first question you know you have to acknowledge uh, i have to acknowledge like i had it easier than than most in mm. the sense that i'm i'm well paid we've got a nice house um I, I don't have those insecurities but it was horrendous you know like from from where i was sitting like uh, uh, the experience i had was um, just the, this what what I have to hold on to because you get further away from it and you've, it dims a bit and you sort of remember the, the some more positive aspects but parts of it I found totally um, almost incapacitating and specifically it was the feeling of having a young child at home and mm. I think anyone who's listening to this or watching this 
who had young children at home who weren't in school during the lockdown while also attempting to do a job from home will recognize this. And you've got a deadline or you've got someone who's expecting something from you or an important call. And then you have a small child too, who, who, who's, too, who's too young to really be independent or to be able to um, take care of like homeschooling on his own. Um, and, and they're kicking off. And, and actually it's a really, it's a very weird and upsetting feeling because it, it feels like it's a combination of sort of sadness and rage. I don't know if there's a word for that. Mm. Sage. Sage. It's despair. It's, it's utter anguish. And, um, you know... Because um, you normally have such control over your yeah, life. And, and now it's like, and what it's do almost I do? Like, and also I'm haunted by the idea that people have of me or may have of me that I'm someone who's sort of relatively... Um, uh, so, so if, uh, you know, in control of his emotions, like st- stoical or has some degree of equanimity, right? Mm. And then here I am thinking like, I, I, I want to go fucking punch a wall or just smash an object <laughs> over my head. Do you know did, what I mean? There was or a few times scream. when you shouted at your kids in your own book and yeah, stuff. And there's, there's, there's an episode. Shouted, I shouted so loud one night. This is shameful. No, but this is healthy to hear from people who aren't... Who Which have, is sort of the point of yeah. writing the book was right. like, I want to own... I don't want to write a book about my personal life it was almost like an antidote to the previous book where I was talking more about my professional life but glossed over aspects of how difficult I find many things about my work-life balance and um, just being a present dad and, and, and husband. And, and so I thought, you know, if I, if I, maybe the point of this book is just to sort of reveal the ugliest part of how I am in the domestic setting. And so there was one night when I can't remember, it was kicking off, the kids weren't going to bed and it was, uh, it was just kicking off and I, and I just just started shouting and, and it was that weird thing where you're shouting and then there's a little part of you going like like the li- there's a little sane tiny homunculus in your brain going like wow you've really lost it <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah like they're still sane like he's become very small yeah because the other there. voice is over is overpowering yeah yeah, yeah. and he's like <clears throat> and he's, he's saying like wow you're shouting really loudly you must have really lost it <laughs> And then, but you're still there, and you go like, "Get into bed now!" And then um, I went back to bed. I remember lying on the bed and go like, "This is weird. Like my heart is beating so fast." <sighs> and I felt like kind of ashamed, yep. and and I've had this sort of adrenaline dump from the rage, and um, and you know, if you're if you're married or you have a significant other, you know, they it's almost like a tag team moment, like. Time out, like get in there, like you know, like you switch, switch out, and 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 I, and I so I looked over at Nancy, my wife, and I'm like, oh, I think I lost it, didn't I? And she's like, yeah, yeah, you did. You tapped out, basically. I tapped out, and I'm like, mm. maybe can you handle it? You know, like Tr- she, traditionally, dad is the the last resort, mother is the first resort. And yeah. You know, when it's really bad, I'm gonna get your daddy. Uh, yeah. What kind of role did well, do you, you pick know, up? What I realized is that a, one of my um sort of pinch points like psychologically when I feel most under stress mm. is when I feel like I'm caught between my wife and my kids mm-hmm. and, and, and my wife said something like um, you, you know you need to handle that or, 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 or th- they're being too loud sort it out right or, or I just feel like I've been given a, it's almost like um, <laughs> a mission. you know when dogs get stressed and they say it's like when they have insecurity about who the leader is and I don't know. I don't even think that's a good analogy, but I just mentioned that because it's like you know they start. They're like unless you're up, they go. I don't have a pack leader. I guess that means I'm the pack leader. I better bite everyone in sight. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you bite your kids. I start <laughs> biting my right. kids. No. So then I go in and the kids are acting up, and then and then I'm feeling like I've been sent one mission right which is to uh, make sure the kids are quiet or get them in their shoes or get them in the bath, and and it's not happening. And if it was, if I didn't have the top level, sort of, if I didn't have my orders, I'd be like, fine, whatever. Fuck it. I might be, or I'd be, I, I wouldn't feel that I'm caught pressure. between the, the pressure. Yeah. And so is, is that, that your own pressure? If you'd have put the pressure on yourself, it wouldn't be that bad. No. It's the fact that Nancy But you can't go back it. to her empty handed. I feel You like need a result here. I need like, I'm, I'm in the middle management position, caught between like two countervailing <laughs> right. forces. You're Tim in the office. It's extreme, maybe so. Like, yeah, it's ext- I don't remember him screaming and shouting no. that much though. No, but you, he just about keeps a level on it. But here's the, the point is that as a result, the next morning I woke up and my vocal cords felt really weird. And then through the course of the day, my voice disappeared and then didn't come back for three days. And for three days, I thought that I, professional broadcaster, podcaster, had actually sort of gone Julie Andrews. Do you remember Julie Andrews lost her voice? Lost her voice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she, 
Maybe that was from not, shouting at her kids. I don't know. But um, I, I thought... I think it's great that you admit that you lost furious. him because you always come across in your documentaries as the calm guy who, in the face of a screaming Nazi or whoever, you manage to always hold your nerve. Yeah. And it just shows that even you, between, as you say, caught between kids and a, and a missus, can lose it. Yeah. And I think that's great. I found that quite a lot in your book where, I, so I've had a wife for about six months now and it was quite insightful because- uh, I've like we, had, a, I had a, 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 it sounds like a car. We ordered her off the website. She was fantastic. <laughs> I've had a wife. It could, yeah. So we've been Any married Any particular now. wife or? Uh, Kosovan, she's lovely. Um, <laughs> So we we've been we've been together for about ten years, but now we've we've been the married for about six months. The normal phrase would be like, "I've been married for about six months." Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, it's difficult to find a normal phrase, but the point is, right? She uh, we've been married for that time, and I found there was a particularly insightful chapter in your book, which actually I listened to as an audio book, where you're talking about being present as a father, yeah. and how your wife uh, says some of the similar things to what my wife currently says, where it's like, you know you're not around enough yeah. for all these kind of things yeah. and how you ended up dealing with that. We actually, so I listened to it on my own, but I actually sat her down and we listened to it together and kind of laughed our way through really? that oh, nice because I was that. like, this was like therapy because you were saying in a way it, it kind of does work out, but one of yeah. you does make some sacrifices. Yeah. It was quite interesting to listen to though, how, how, how much you do reveal about yourself. Cause I think, in your previous but before that you'd almost gone the other way where you've gone I don't like to, people That's knowing right. too much about and in fact, the f I've got three books and the first one I say almost nothing about yeah. anything personal that's what I was struck by and then the, in the middle one which is uh, got to get through, through this, this yeah. I talk a bit about um, the home front battles on the home front and struggles over um, me being away a lot for work and then I went all in that was sort of the whole point of this one through the keyhole was to own up to short of uselessness in the domestic setting and that feeling of like people say you know, how do you, you know the question i'm probably asked more than any other um you know when i do q and a's and stuff is like how, how do you stay i gotta ask how do you stay so calm when talking to these ku klux klansmen or 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 racists or cult crazy cult members what, what do you say and 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 what i always have is this sort of um slight guilty feeling of it doesn't really require a great deal of effort. And if anything, I, I have to G myself up to be confrontational. Like my natural setting in, in work mode is sort of quite passive, which I think it can be a strength. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe um, uh, one of my sort of um, qualities as a journalist that's, that's allowed me to get into places others haven't and create programs others haven't and, and, and is that I don't feel an, a strong urge to take people on. If people say things that are kind of controversial or outrageous, I, well, I'm not thinking like, that's wrong, like stop it. I'm thinking like, oh, how interesting. I, I wonder where that comes from you know, tell me more. That's your superpower as, Maybe, as an individual. Yeah, in and my, I think my as, weakness, and don't you think weaknesses are superpowers in general? It, it, both, yeah. yeah. So for example, if I was to try and do the same thing, this, like I have a, a, a much more threatening appearance and therefore they, they would be, yeah, I guess, debatable. less likely. You're cheating because you're showing off your tattoos. No, like, <laughs> yeah, if, no. you, if you had your short sleeves on, yeah, you'd be a say, lot more we'd intimidating. Say, we'd say all the, the, no, the gun shots. And, and the, the uh, prison but, tattoos but, you got. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, you, are, you have this chameleon effect on people where you can slip in and not f be that um, <clears throat> person who they're going to look at and go I can't tell him this in case this is the reaction they accept you and you uh, th it's genius the way you never apart from Scientology I believe you've always been invited by these people in That's and right. it's not one of those things where uh, they're not willing participants. They're That's they're, right. they're understanding. Well, to a degree, they're understanding mm -hmm. what they're getting themselves into. And one of the things that struck me when I was watching all of your work was, if you ever look back on it and feel a bit, look, some of these are, are what I would call bad people, like you know these religious nutters and and racists and people who hate gay people. They're terrible people, but at the same time, they are people, and a lot of them probably were oblivious to what they were really getting themselves into mm. it's not like where me and you were talking here and we know this is going to be seen by a lot of people and you, you know what is happening and i know what's happening fully some of them didn't and i wondered if you ever had a little element of uh, was that the right like you know because now they're forever that, that person, nutter yeah. and it's everywhere forever yeah. you know what i mean yeah i mean in a way um Dealing with that and thinking that through was 
um, a process that I went on through the course of um, the first five years of making programs, mm. right? And, and I, I came into program making via um, being a correspondent for a TV show called TV Nation that was hosted by Michael Moore. And Michael Moore is an out-and-out satirist who's, whose mission in life is to sort of set the world to rights by um, satirizing the bad guys and sending them up. And, 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 and also, not to sound weird, but I always liked prank shows. And, you know, for me, things like Candid Camera, Beatles About, Game, Happy. Game for a Laugh, later Trigger Happy. But, although, but Trigger Happy was... So that wasn't formative for me. The, form, the ones that were formative that I then thought... Uh, and, and that I thought, that's, that, that's, that's, the, that's gold. Kind of like Bora originally, huh? Yeah, yeah. Or indeed... Brass Eye. Really. Yeah, right. We, we Chris sort of, Morris. Who's sort of the godfather yeah. of that second generation or, you know, that sort of more modern era of um, pranksters where their idea... Because everyone knew who Alan Funt was who did Candy Camera. Everyone knew who Jeremy Beadle was. And then the, the, sort of the next iteration was, what about if we never break character, right? Mm -hmm. We make it even more, sort of, in a sense, merciless mm -hmm. by not having the moment where we show you how funny you looked when we made your car disappear and you didn't know where it was right so i came into tv thinking that that's really the that's the funny space in fact-based comedy is is getting one over on people mm -hmm. but actually that wasn't really i didn't really like doing it that much mm -hmm. and you know in those, those little first forays of of doing it and i quite quickly evolved into a into a different work mode which just involved spending time with outrageous people and being more of a straight person because if you're a prankster they're in a sense the straight person, you know, in the comic setting. Like, whereas um, the prankster is the funny, the funny one. But I, I don't really. I'm not. I'd much rather be among people who are outrageous or, or intriguing or, or, or unusual, or interesting, and just drill into that. And so, um, but your question was about: Did I have regrets? Did I think about? You know, there were times when um, I was aware that afterwards, the the people that I interviewed revisited what we did or felt as though we weren't fully informing them about the nature of what we were doing it was it was more the exception than the rule there's definitely things i look back at now where i think oh that's a bit painful or that's a slightly cheap shot or why are you pushing quite so hard on that it feels borderline harassive or bullying what sort of thing oh um so uh, some of them are in are VO lines where I think, oh, that VO line feels a bit judgmental. There's a moment in the Swingers program where we arrive at, at the checkout counter of a supermarket. Uh, it, it, I'm with the woman who's hosting the Swingers party. She's very nice. She's very obliging. And she's like, she's like, now when we go in there, don't, you know, don't say that we're doing it for a Swingers party, okay? Because people can be very judgmental. So then we're at the checkout counter and I start going, Margaret, Margaret, maybe we should. She's quite attractive. Shall we invite her to the party? <laughs> Just to be a goof, right? And she's like, no, don't mention it. No, but why don't she might want to come to the party? Mm. And she had, no, don't mention the party. And it's not, it's not like horrible. It's just, it's just a sort of needling. You're not taking it as seriously as she is. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's, it's a tiny bit. It, you know, when I watch it now, I'm like, is it that funny or is it a little mm. bit unkind? There's another one. I mean, it, it's going to sound really trivial to you because it's these are in the judgment, like in, it's all of in in the in the roster of crimes of television that I've committed, these are relatively uh, small. But, 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 but that, this was the question that was asked, right? So another one is when I'm talking to a, a guy called Troy Halston, who's a porn performer, and he's gay for pay is the term. Mm -hmm. and, and then after he's done his, and, and, and I'm like, well, are you really straight and just being gay for pay? Or are you actually bisexual, right? Or gay, right? Um, <clears throat> after he's had his gay sex for, the, for, for money in, in the porn scene, he goes, uh, well, I, I said, what, so what did you have to do? You gave a guy a blowjob? He goes, like, yeah, I can't remember the exact line, but he goes, like, unfortunately. And then something about that rankled, right? Like I thought, well, if you're going to do it, don't be like, <laughs> Enjoy <it>. unfortunately. <laughs> like be like, yeah, you know what I mean? You can't have it both ways. I, I mean, I might have been wrong. Right. I know, I might have been wrong. So he goes, unfortunately. Put a bit of enthusiasm yeah, on right, it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what they were saying and on so well, I though. heard myself say, oh, come on, you enjoyed it. <laughs> right. Or something like that. The one, Which, that, the one that... 
which which again was I think I'm, it's not the worst thing in the world. It was made. I'd have to see it again. No, but you. So, but, but this I, is the it strikes thing, me right? as a tiny bit unfair. And I remember in the edit there was a conversation about shall we take that bit out? Right. And at the time I was like, take it out. What are you talking about? That's one of the you know funny bits in the <laughs> in the film. But but evidently the director and the series producer were like, oh, that's really on the edge of a bit mean or maybe even. I don't know, homophobic? No, because he's bullshitting himself because there are some things you can do be and be like, yeah, unfortunately, like, you know, I, I don't know, you may, may not have swept the house up properly or right, whatever. Right, right, yeah. He's using a word that doesn't fit. With the blowjob. Putting a dick in your mouth and, and, jo- and getting on with it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that ain't something you, well, unfortunately. But, but also, it just, doesn't fit it what didn't, he did. Right, it did need a response, it needed a response Absolutely. from me. Like, right. for me to go, mm-hmm. Come on. Like, mm-hmm. But so I went, so I sh- probably should have said, um, what, so you didn't enjoy it at all? That would have been fine. Right. But what I said was, come on, you enjoyed it a bit. Or something yeah. like that, but I quite like that. And also, but also, I wonder if you take those things out, then I don't see how. I, part of what I like is watching the relationship between you and the people you are with develop. Oh, right, one of yeah, my but- favourite ones was when you became sort of friends with the problematic prostitute uh, in that uh, brothel house where originally you had this really sort of Hayley. edgy relationship where she kind of was testing you, and mm-hmm. clearly, I mean, she didn't have great relationships with men, kind of bullying you a little bit but and, but you stayed with it mm-hmm. and eventually won her over and became quite friendly it was You're a lovely right. arc yeah yeah, yeah. Haley was her working name mm. and uh, she in her first interview was very obliging and, and but just obviously intelligent and thoughtful and reflective in a way that um, to me was surprising at the time and um and and then she kind of realized I don't know if she got my number or she was she was shrewd and she figured out that she needed to take control of the situation and so she said like I'm not going to do any more interviews unless you book a party with me which is the term and um, and so I feel like you had to kind of win her over and once you did that you yeah. went in then that, then then we did we I booked a, a massage yeah. which I paid for out of my own money no license pay money. Went for that. Oh, went minded. towards that. That's fine. Yeah. I remember I... It's come towards much worse things. I, arrived, I had Polish neighbours at the time and, I, and, and on the day after the programme went out, I arrived back at my house in Halston and uh, the neighbour, he was quite a grumpy old man and he, and he said, I see this programme and for this we pay our licence fee. <laughs> It's, it's not often you get you normally the people only bother to give you feedback if it's positive yeah. but actually to be reprimanded by someone who's pissed off and not it. actually from the country uh, well he's himself. basically he's UK you still yeah, you still well, got to pay whether you have a TV you, you've know, got the TV long, you pay the fee how long Lawrence that's right. the question that's a very good point um, so, so when, you, when she's on this is the thing I wondered she was a what many men would consider attractive woman, tall, blonde, mm-hmm. good boobs and bum, all of that was in sure. place. Well, she's a and you're obviously a guy in a relationship at the time. She's straddling you, massaging you. Um, and you seem quite sort of nervous, awkward. It was, it was, it was, it was a lovely moment to, to sort of watch you. But were you feeling attracted to her was that a difficult thing for you to go through uh no, no. even though she wasn't your clearly you went on a wavelength romantically but it's a, a naked woman on top of you. Uh, right I, you know hand on heart i wasn't it wasn't for me an erotic encounter mm. it was it was it was awkward it was embarrassing and um and that was exactly what she wanted out of it Absolutely. and i think and i think oddly though in in disarming me you know, and, and realizing how um, almost defenseless I was in one sense, like, like kind of in a sense, you know, figuratively but literally also uh-huh. naked, although I had boxes on. I think in disarming me, she sort of disarmed herself because I think she was surprised that I did it. I think, and I think when she saw, you know, how it's it's hard to be angry at someone who's defenseless, and I think she had her dander was up a bit. She was, uh, you know, she, I think she'd been feeling a bit like, what am I getting out of this documentary? I've given him a few interviews. Mm-hmm. Why, why should I even do this? Unless you book a party, then I'm not even going to give you. Then once I did it, she get she gets all giggly yeah. and, and she's like t- saying all kinds of things and and I, and then although I'm sort of awkward and embarrassed to be there, but I start asking questions and doing interviews during the during the, the massage, and then she answers them yeah. very uh, very candidly. 
Because you proved you weren't above her. Right. I, and, and maybe she was thinking that at the start. Like, who's this British journalist coming in? But now you're literally there half naked on her table. And you're clearly saying, look, I, I don't think I'm better than you. I'm willing to be a part of this or so, to a degree. So you called her bluff in a sense? I, I, I think that that really... Uh, as someone who may want to make something like that one day it was a bit of a lesson for me yeah. well, all right okay specifically you want to make the prostitute document. well no, i mean i'm just, just checking it was it was admirable the way you just got your sort of hands dirty so to speak. well i, I appreciate that, that you know in the end um you know that kind of participation in in in, in a documentary it has to be uh handled in quite a careful way and i think to to be there and say like i'm gonna get a ma- you know, massage from a working girl um it could be crass and 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 actually because she dictated the terms and even with her dictating the terms it really needs a lot of thinking through and and um you know and it wasn't totally straightforward on the home front like you can imagine i i was i wasn't married at the time but i my the woman who is now my wife was my relatively new girlfriend in fact one of the things that told me what a special person she was was the level of kind of coolness and 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 sort of self-possession she showed when i showed it to her like she wasn't gonna let me see that it bothered her but she's like she just said oh you are flirting with her a bit and like she just clocked it she knew exactly what was going on but she's like i'm not gonna um make a big thing out of it it takes quite a lot of, there's um you do show her quite a bit of your work don't you like there's a point in oh, your yeah. book where you talk about showing her a meth documentary yeah, yeah, and yeah. she tells you 20 minutes in that's the first time you smiled in the documentary yeah right. she thought I was going down a kind of the not the wrong she, she felt like I wasn't playing to my strengths in, in the sort of document I went I went for a while <clears throat> I realised that me in dangerous or, or semi-dangerous settings was a kind of winning formula for um, for documentaries you know you're always looking I, I did, almost the hardest thing in, in, in the work that I do is just finding the initial idea like what is the space the subject the theme that will allow you to get 60 minutes that will have light and shade, a compelling narrative, actuality unfolding on screen. So for a while after I did one about San Quentin prison, I thought, wow, this, you know, which got 6 million viewers, which is really high for us. I thought this is a great, um, this is a great kind of seam of, of material because um, I, I can just find other settings that promise some kind of danger, whether it's uh, embedding with in high crime areas of American cities or other cities or you know investigating drug use in, in a kind of real world so so I did that for a couple of years and then sh- I think it got to the point where so it was becoming a bit it was in danger of becoming a bit one note and she she picked up on that that was in that was in quite a sort of a weird period as well in your relationship I think in that yeah. point in the book you're talking about how we had two young children yeah. I was away a lot and um, she, you know I think like a lot of women who have kids and have successful careers, but then take time out from their careers in order to be more around mm-hmm. for, the, for, for the kids. Like she was, she was uh, sort of pulled in two directions between missing work, but also wanting to be present for the family. And I think resented um, the fact that I had made fewer compromises. Whereas, I mean, I, I talk about all of this in, in that book. That's the middle one got to get through this where my parents both worked so i um i was used to having a, 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 an au pair who who would come and, and be there when i got home from school and um and my dad would go away you know he's a travel writer he would go away sometimes for months at a time and so i thought oh well this you know we all sort of bring in a sort of sense of expectation of family life based on what we experienced growing up right mm-hmm. so i sort of thought well you know, if you want to be back in the workspace, that's fine. We'll just bring in a no pair. And she's like, no, no, I don't want someone else looking after our kids. I want one of us looking after them. And I think it, it shouldn't always be me. And that became quite a big um, butting of heads point. You know, I, I, it took me a while to sort of take on board actually how much she was um, really going through you know, with my absences and looking back on it, you know, if I made three films a year, which I tended to, and they each required, uh, a ra- you know, up to four weeks of filming, that was really about three months. That's a quarter of the year, you know, and, and that, that with, young, with a young family, that you're taking a lot of kind of emotional equity out of the bank. What happened in the, there's a point in the book that I was kind of interested in is when you said there was a sign that you completely overlooked or it didn't quite strike you when you were in a, a fancy hotel with mm. embroidered 
uh, robes. Yes. And she tells you something at that point. What? Uh, she said... Um, oh, she said, uh, if you were ever thinking of having a, um, a relationship outside the marriage, or, 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 or like straying, I can't remember how she phrased it. She said, I would be okay with that. And, what, and, what, and at that point, I think... And you I said was like, oh, well, that's cool. Like, I'm not going to... Like, I, I, you know, I, one of the, like, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know if a lot of men are like this. I tend to think more, more are, like, than women. I know, like, those kind of sex, I, gender I'm, I'm worrying options. that this was a trick question, just to see what you'd say. <laughs> yeah. You know what right. I mean? But, yeah, oh, right. you can, you can stray. Right, yeah. yeah. She, yeah. It was actually a hidden, there, the, the thing that was. Are you gonna? Uh, there was actually a hidden camera in the room, and it was a BBC documentary uh, they were yeah. making on you at that Catching point. And Larry. you fucked it all up, because you just basically went, yeah, fine. Instead of going, hold on a minute, and then yeah. they'd have burst out and gone, surprise. Well, yeah, okay. yeah. You took it a bit far there. No, it was funny. It could have been. It could have been. Like, do, I don't, I'm a stranger to myself in many ways. Like, and I, I, I don't always even know what I'm feeling half the time. Right, you yeah. know, sometimes it's like that, you know, talking about that little man who's saying, like, you're kind of angry. It's sort of like, it'd be nicer for the big man. Like, you, your totally integrated self realized, wow, I'm angry. I need to calm down. You know, it would be nice if, in general, uh, you know, you knew what you were feeling. Sometimes I catch myself just think like i talk about this in uh, through the keyhole like it was christmas i was quite hung over because uh, on christmas eve i'd gone to town on the no on, on the bourbon and i woke <laughs> up theme and I, I was like and 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 west no e17 and stay another day came on i was like this is the worst song i've ever heard in my it's life depressing, isn't it? and i just oh. thought that what an evil song what an evil band like the group they must be to bring out now obviously it was all projection like i i what i should have said is like wow i i must be not just hung over but really grumpy to to pour so much undeserved scorn on a on a completely innocuous song and group right and, um, and, and, and I think in general, like a lot of my emotions, I tend to experience almost by observing their effects like a scientist, as opposed to experiencing them like a human. Do you right. know what I mean? No, yeah, but totally. you, 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 you don't come across as the most emotional guy ever. That's, no. uh, in, in your documentaries, that was one of the things that sort of struck me as part of the brilliance is obviously you're not showing too much emotion and therefore people don't really know how to read you but little do they know it's because you're not really sure what to think about it yourself, or feel about it yourself <laughs> yeah, yeah. as it happens that yeah it, very rarely did i see a tear come to your eye yeah. or do you think is that something that maybe the missus has mentioned to you about you could be more emotional or is that something that you think is a, a thing that you've struggled with or is that fine uh okay interesting question she doesn't say you know whether or not <clears throat> i think she thinks i'm kind of an emotional um idiot like in other words like i'm not an em emotionally mature i think she would say i'm not an emotionally mature person which obviously she doesn't make a habit of saying it but i think if you asked her <sighs> she might say that um which obviously if she said you know and we all say things in if we're having a row or yeah. something that we that aren't the kindest things, but mm. but might be based in some kind of truth. And and I think when she if she said that, obviously I've then thought, well, how that's probably true, right? And and actually, isn't that odd that um, I'm in the line of work that I am, where which hinges on a certain degree of um, um, emotional perceptiveness, right? Or, or or some sort of level of psychological acuity, like one would hope. Like I, I okay, I'm gonna. This is uh, this is me boasting. I've never mentioned this, but uh, not boasting. But when I, I was given, I was I was very proud to receive an honorary fellowship in the Royal College of Psychiatry. Like I made a number of programs about mental illness. Like, I was so proud, like to get that. You know, I haven't been knighted, and I haven't Yet. got a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, but um, I am a f honorary fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatry, which is um, which I just think like is is a, is, a, is, a, is a, you know take it for what it's worth. I felt very proud to get it and. And it suggests they, that they, some medical professionals in the field of mental health saw some of my programs and thought, well, that guy seems to be doing something positive. And yet he, my wife, according to my wife, and I believe her, I'm also an emotional, um, emotionally immature person. So how those two things sit by, side by side, I don't quite know. I, I mean, I'm you're a documentary know. filmmaker, which part of the editing process alone is storytelling and trying to make the audience feel something, which you obviously do very well. So I'm not saying that you're an emotional, you know. Well, I wonder if almost that it takes <laughs> a degree of coldness and detachment to to go into those worlds. And um, it was something actually, um, you know, when I did, 
I, I met up, hey, you mentioned Haley, the, the, the working girl, mm-hmm. sex worker who who was at the the, um, the brothel in Nevada. And a few years afterwards, I went and looked her up. Um, again, it was for it was for the, uh, a book, and um, and I, and I met up with her in, in and she was working as a waitress in a small town in Northern California. And I talked to her about she just wanted to hang out, like in a social setting. And it was a slightly awkward encounter where I was there, like, oh, I'm doing a follow up, you know, I'm in my professional mode. And then she's there, like, oh, I just wanted to hang out. I thought you were a cool guy. Like, are you? Am I just material for you? And I'm like, um, I don't. Yes, kind of. You know, like. Which made me feel obviously a bit shitty, mm. but she and then what she said was like, "Wow, so you go around doing interview?" I was like, "Oh, I'd like to do something on pimps. Do you know any pimps?" And she's like, "No, they're they're, they're very you know devious and, and cruel people, and the girls who go with them are weak minded or vulnerable or have all sorts of complex psychological needs. Like, why would you even want to do that? Like, that's very dark." And I'm like, "Yeah, it's kind of what I." Do. My thing. Mm. She's, and then she says, "You must be, you either must be very unfeeling, or extremely, um, or, or or have some dark part of you that you even want to go into those places." Mm. Like, I mean, I only Jesus, make Jesus. All like, of the, she, she flipped it on you. She huh? flipped it on me, and and I, and, and what, whatever the case is, I don't really know, but I do recognise that it's not completely uh, normal, right? To actually, in because I do enjoy my work, to enjoy being in. Um, you know, the two weeks I spent at Koalinga, the, the, the mental hospital for paedophiles, were like two very satisfying weeks of work. Because you, you, you knew you yeah. were getting the material, though. Yeah, and, and that, yeah. that feeling. I dodged that. I didn't yeah. say happiest weeks of no, my life. No, I know. But, but Did you, you think I was going to say that? No, but I, I, think, would it, have been I think it would be funny. You would have been happy as it was happening. As it was going on, I felt as though it was um, just extraordinary, like revealing, uh, just you're, th- you're engaged, like mentally, emotionally, like everything about it. Yeah. And it wasn't particularly hard work. Like you, you, they, they basically said, well, you can be there during working hours from nine till five. So come five o'clock, Clock we went off. back to the hotel. The hotel was next to a ranch where um, the, where they, they basically, you know, it was a butchery as well. And they had steaks. It was a steakhouse. <laughs> attached, <laughs> the hotel was attached to a ranch steakhouse. And it was like, I mean, it, people are going to be, you know, saying I'm not paying my license fee for BBC crew. It wasn't particularly expensive, but that was where we ended. But don't worry <laughs> about the price. It's Louis. okay. He's always was, covering his it. back. It's worth the money, is what they say. Uh, uh, your bit, you're is the, the bit last that thing justifies that the license the point, fee. The point well, is, the is that I was. It was. You know, it didn't. I don't know if, uh, whether that was a normal reaction. Although, you know, my I think my crew found it a kind of int- interesting and stimulate. You know, intriguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah place to work as well so I don't know that I don't know does it, does it make me weird or not I'm Go, not going sure. back to her criticism yeah. though saying oh you must be really dark if you look at the most viewed shows on Netflix or Amazon they're all dark and crime and rape and mm-hmm. hor- horrible shit because for whatever reason as people we're fascinated by the darkness in humanity aren't we yeah. so yeah it's interesting to know where the line is so for example the recent um, incident of child cruelty where the child was um, more or less uh, beaten and tortured to death. Do you remember this happened over the whole, you know, oh, Christmas and New Year yeah. period? they got put away. Yeah. yeah, the parents got put away. I think it was the stepmother had, had done it. Was it two mothers? No, it was no. a mother and a father. Mother oh. and a father. It, was, it, it was, was pretty a, horrific. It was it? absolutely... Well, here's the thing is I didn't really read about that because just seeing the picture of the kid um, was upsetting and, yeah. and then reading the details, which I, I imagined, because I didn't read it, but I imagined would be just something I didn't really need. Yeah, so there was a Netflix documentary about a kid who was locked in a cupboard and I got halfway through that documentary, if that, and I remember thinking, I can't do this anymore. Like it's... I know I'm going to like have nightmares about this. And to me, when when you start talking about the specifics of what happens to a child, for example, you know, that is just too much for me to watch yeah absolutely and, and by the same token like the whole point of the Koalinga program wasn't mm. like let's go and hang out with some paedophiles and see what they're all about it was actually um, that made you laugh <laughs> it was just like it was know, just a good way to be fair if you pitched that I would have commissioned yeah. well because uh, you know it, it was like so um, it was actually let's find out about this place that purports to be able to reform paedophiles mm-hmm. and get to know those paedophiles and sex offenders 
who are making the most compelling case for the fact that they may have been uh, rehabilitated. So the, the, although there are a couple of characters in it, Mr. Yarn and Mr. Kitchens we've mentioned, who don't embrace, embrace treatment, they're single encounters. But the people we go on a journey with, the, the, the three main characters, are people who are deep into the therapy mm -hmm. and are making a plausible, on the face of it, accounting of themselves as having taken on board what they've done that's wrong. So, so whether or not they, they have, or, you know, whether it's authentic or not is debatable, but actually the premise of the program is, is there any road back for, for an ingrained pedophile? At what point is someone, what is unforgivable? Where is the line? You know, it, so yeah, I think that it's like, it's not done. And I think that's what I probably would have said to Haley is like, no, I'm not, I don't want to go make a film and just see, um, pimps being obnoxious, I don't think. But I am interested in um, the, 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 the grey areas of relationships, the line between kind of the normal, the, the normal strains, the, the normal anguish, which, is, which resides in all sorts of intimate relationships, and the line where it becomes uh, something bordering on abusive, right? Yeah, and, and that's or kind toxic, of... Which is, and it's not clear always... I think always you've done a great job of that, though, like, but, in, in showing that some of the humanity and some of these people who've done these horrific things we did another one thank you for that we did another one like a few years later we were doing three programs about la called la stories and we had two one was about um people on the edge of life in hospital embracing last chance treatments you know people with cancer brain injuries and in, in non-responsive states and to see how at what point do you say do you know what i've done enough i need to let go you're right or rather than torture myself with false hope and expensive treatments the second one was about dogs in high crime areas and then we had a third one about comedians that didn't work out it was like well what do we do now this one it you know this doesn't have enough emotional angst mm -hmm. so we almost as a lot you know sometimes when your back's against the wall you go for something that feels like, well, we know we can do this because we've been there before. And we did one about sex offenders in a small in a small housing, um, in a little sort of hostel in, in an industrial area of LA where they all live together because of various laws about where they can live. They're, they're out on probation or parole, so they're in some sense free. I but, remember this one, yeah. Yeah, but they're also monitored. Some of them are on the edge of homelessness. They have to check in. There's mm -hmm. various rules about what they can and can't do. And it was another one where... Um, uh, you know, how, what's our justification? But because of the nature of the monitoring, it becomes, it's really an examination of, again, how do, pe how do we reintegrate? Do we reintegrate people who've done dreadful things at the point when they're released? But among the contributors were one or two who we filmed and afterwards it's like, we can't put this person in. It's just too dreadful. Like, it doesn't feel, you just watch it and you just don't feel good about even seeing it do you mm. know what, does that make sense yeah so so i i mean it's a kind of long-winded re re response no, to what you originally sense. said which was like yeah we all enjoy uh, true crime many of us at least and 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 dark themes but i do also i think it's easy to overlook the fact that there needs to be i think for me anyway some redemptive quality some quality of how is this enriching my understanding of who i am who we are as people where is the hope, you know, where is, and where, where is the intriguing ambiguity? One great series, I think, that I, w I remember feeling everything that you're just describing. So you're very in touch with your audience and what you're trying to explain, for sure, because the Westboro Baptist mm -hmm. Church uh, series was one where I was constantly thinking, is there any hope for these mm -hmm. people? Like, where is the... Is the and there was one girl who... I felt like you were hoping there was some good in her mm -hmm. as a younger person. Mm -hmm. And and you asked her, like, have you ever had feelings mm -hmm. about a man or whatever? And she sort of laughed. And you could say, like, you're in denial here. Like, yeah. you're clearly, you know, not what you're pretending to be. And it, it it's like the blue pill or the red pill. Like, is she going to continue with this? Is she not? And then you come back years later and you say now she's fully gone with it and That's there right. is no saving her soul. And if anything now, just like I think it might have been a mother and elder, when she's saying horrible things about gay people or whoever. You can eat your babies. Yeah, she's, uh, nice, yeah, nice. she's, uh, she's laughing Allen. now. So she's gone from feeling uncomfortable to embracing it. And like, it's like some Star Wars kind of let the hate flow through you. Like and she looks different, yeah, doesn't she? Yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah, that, that sort of was a great story. Jail Phelps. And in fact, uh, it kind of, uh, yeah, my gifts of prognostication are obviously not what I would wish for in the sense that I thought she had, as you say, some 
part of her that was up for grabs, right? Mm -hmm. in, in the sense of um, salvageable, like mm -hmm. that she would maybe see her way out of it. And you're, I said something like, have you ever had moments where you strayed or wanted to stray? <laughs> her face went bright red. And mm -hmm. she went... <sighs> And she, it was, it was half a laugh and half even look a kind of high, sigh of despair. Like it was this really odd moment of affect where she sort of, um, so silly. So she said, so silly, so silly. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to think about that. And, and you see like, oh, right, it is present for her and it's still real for her. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it and hung the, in the balance with her there. Yeah. There's an element of cognitive dissonance in it where she's kind of actively denying what seems to be even true to her. Oh, and yeah. you're kind of, you're awkwardly bringing up the truth in that sense. Well, I wonder, I almost think it's, what it is is that she's, um, she's definitely, I don't think it's denial in the classic sense because I no. think she actually knows exactly what she's feeling. And I think um, she's saying like, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to think on it. I don't even want to, she's like, uh, she's like, yes, there's a little box in here and, and exactly what you're describing is in it. And of course, I'm not going to let you look at it. I don't even want to look at it. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and the funny thing about her was, uh, 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 yeah, she was the one of, of the ones I thought she, who, she was the one I thought might be up for grabs. She stayed, but virtually all the others, the, the women, the young women that I spoke to left uh, and made new lives for themselves. And when I went back for the third one, JL Phelps, this one that stayed and became more and more hardline. She seemed to become more embittered. She married mm. a guy from, do you remember from where? From from the north of England. Uh, Man, yeah, and he moved over Manchester, there. And was, it was, was, it was close to Burnley Manchester. Though. Or yeah, it was Blackburn? somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Might have been yeah. Blackburn. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And he, he felt like a, I mean. He, he was an odd one. You know, in America, you're sort of like, oh, it's kind of the culture there. When they do it from England, it's even weirder to me. Yeah. So it felt that it, and it's kind of strange because you she didn't all, seem happy either. Exactly, yeah. It I didn't mean, seem happy I, in America. I think that that sort of comes with the territory of someone who adopts that as, as misery inside. Yeah. I felt that, but I also felt the but element. What about the other documentary maker who had joined? He Steve was Drain. crazy. Yeah. To be fair, he, so he was. Nuts. He, if you think about him focusing on a subject matter, though, he was very good at unpacking it. You know, he really did a good he job. Was of a very, exploring. He was a very smart guy. Yeah. And that, I think that was part of what made it also uncomfortable was a lot of those people were living the lie and you had gone in there and were very much presenting them with it. And yeah. it was even worse when the Englishman was there because in many ways, his personality was, I'm English and I sort of endorse this because I'm, you know, it could just be you crazy Americans, but I'm English and I'm yeah. over here. And then you were stepping in the room and be like, shit, another Englishman's here and he sees this as crazy. Yeah. That felt quite... That's one of those moments where when you were talking about, um, you know, being cruel or undermining people, that's where I sometimes wondered how you felt, whether you were putting someone in such an awkward situation and it led them to such a horrible realization that you felt uncomfortable doing that. Because I had that feeling when I watched the one about polyamory, is it? Mm -hmm. Where you take- That's a good example. The partner outside and chat in the garden. Yeah. <laughs> and you weird, basically, and you, that's basically your approach is, you're not, you're not happy here, are you? Is basically what you were saying. Yeah. But it was so difficult for them to unpack that with you. And you could see the cognitive dissonance working in their minds. Well, there was a moment in that one where... Um, are they pregnant or something at that point? Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, oddly enough, I think he was going through something. I think that he was fine. Like, I, I, don't, I think it was... A, a, um, he was having an emotional low. I, I, when I see that, I'm not troubled by that material. I think... Um, he he was sort of robust enough to handle it, and I think yeah. they, maybe partly because they were young, and th there was a lot going on, and there was a lot to be happy about in their lives. The, the guys who, at the end, but there was also a, a family who there, were, there was a woman who, who was married to a guy, slightly heavy set, out of shape, schlubby guy who um, they 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 clearly they were somewhat physically estranged, right? They were still making the best show of being together and making it work but she was going and she went, would go off and see this other guy with his so with consent from from her husband yeah. and basically had, they had a kind of weekly or twice weekly arrangement where they would go and fuck and have fun and giggle and be like teenagers and then meanwhile man number one is at home and he didn't have like he had no polyamorous uh person that he was, was having the older with. guy yeah, yeah. oh and you he feel, was really likable and you feel really sorry for him because clearly he's sort of he's kind of stuck in a difficult situation yeah. and it's kind of it's okay if behind closed doors you can be humiliated but suddenly he's kind of on tv and you're sort of going well here's the thing because i have to be some i i have to step back because i recognize that 
you know all interpretations are in their way valid like I, what what when i i what i saw was this guy's getting left out right and i more or less <laughs> you deserve some pussy too right, and i put I, I i more or less put that to them sure. and, and and um and then they are very politely and nicely saying no 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 that isn't what it is like i, I you know the man saying i'm fine and the woman saying like he's fine and you know he has permission to do what he wants and and he hasn't found i'd love him to find that person and then he said and i say something like um well is it an option for him to come in on a three-way you know with you and the other fella right or or so, i can't remember how it even i think even he introduces it mm. and he's like if they ever wanted me to maybe kind of stand and, and watch oh god i remember I the way he said it as and well. i'm like it was I, so... I guess i'd be okay with oh. that and then her face of like she's like she sort of thinking like biggest boner killer ever <laughs> yeah right to have my husband w- watching and she's like i don't know that i would feel that would oh, be oh god and then you right. see his little heart break in then, slow motion like ralph yeah. wiggum yeah exactly like, yeah the, that exact brutal. moment brutal yeah. yeah and he's like what i can't even you, yeah mate, like can, i can't even watch surely, my wife have sex with someone else your wife shagging someone else the <laughs> yeah. one upside is at least you get a watch yeah, right okay fucking yeah. hell man. just in case he, guy. He, he he should have been able to test drive being a cuckold even if that was just sort of his he didn't even just give it a he try didn't even get the cuckold level no he's beneath that what is that? He just sat on the couch. What's that called? Imagining it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The best he's got is imagining his estranged wife having sex at that point. Yeah. And well, you've just gone in there people, and I feel I have to stick up for cuckolds in the sense that, like, this, that's a Good thriving subculture, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. There's yeah. a lot of um, self respecting men who enjoy watching another man come in and, you know, boss really? whoever but they're he with. Didn't yeah. 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 He didn't even get that. He didn't even get that. You know what I mean? Right term. Uh, he didn't get that. He and the thing was also he first said like maybe we could have a three way, and she's like I don't know. And then he's like, oh, I could just stand and watch. And she's yeah. like, no, maybe I could be not. outside the door. Yeah, he's like, well, maybe you could write me a letter about it. Yeah, literally. Oh God. But, but, you know what is interesting about that? And that was something that was that he didn't say that. Right, he didn't say that, but that. Yeah, but it was a good joke. But the the interesting aspect of that is, and I think what you um, down the series when it start when your first series starts out, a lot of it seems a bit more on the nose, should we say? Yeah. And as you go on. I think you uh, not that you need your own documentaries evaluating to you but what I find interesting is along the way you begin to trust that the audience will see it a bit more than you need to give it or you need to show it that's possibly true I mean I think look that's a sensitive psychological situation that they're in can I say and also just to stick up for him for one moment we're not mocking him in a bad way I think I quite like him here's what so here's the thing what he faces is a dilemma like there's an aspect of the relationship something's happened in the relationship that means or in their makeup, right? That means that she wants to go and have sex with another guy. What she was having with that other guy was real. Like it was a one for, for them, wonderful. Like he loved shaking her, she loved shaking him. Good for them. If in a non polyamorous scenario, I think there's a real um, realistic uh, possibility that she would have just left him. Mm-hmm. She would have thought, "I'm not getting everything I need in this relationship." That's what she should have done. And then he is then like a lot of like guys. Uh, in their 50s who, 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 who aren't maybe taking good physical care of themselves who aren't maybe like sort of super effervescent personalities yeah. he would be living like the, the kid no longer has two parents under the same roof and he's living probably on his own or, or, or you know like I, his alternative is not brilliant does that make sense? But yes. I, so I would have worried so he, for him. So if, he, so, so if you game out, what I don't know if you're suggesting this or not, what it looks like for him, if he says, like, I'm not putting up with this, you either end it or it's over. She's like, fine, I'm ending it. And then he's... Is that not the reason why she's straying though? Because he's not that guy with balls who would say that. He is flat. He's boring. He's white rice, as they would say. But, in but the some hangover. people like white no, rice. No, but that's the thing. Right, but she rice obviously didn't. was great with, what, a green curry. A green there's curry. no green curry. Yeah, exactly. It's just white rice and sat on the couch. <laughs> right, I get and, that. And, and, well, and I feel sorry for him because that. we, like, you ever seen... Um, me, myself and Irene where like she yes. runs off with the limo guy mm-hmm. like I feel like men like that it's the one Jim Carrey film yeah I'd yeah. forgotten about I, the limo that was I a just, great film yeah. I just remember there's a transition where they go from someone pooping to a close up shot of some chocolate ice cream, ice cream coming <laughs> yeah. in yeah. that was so, a very comedy but, of but that the point day is, is like Farrelly Brothers people can mm. snap one day and 
and kill them all. Well, yeah, and, and that's the worry is one day she's shagging this other guy and a shotgun just comes through the door and bang. Right. But that's also because he's been put in such a horrible situation. Yeah. And his situation and that loneliness very much reminded me of the early time when you went to, I think it was Thailand. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was so, there was such a great, uh, that this, it, what you have is a good timeline of I feel like you should hook certain people up so that guy needs to break up with the wife who's cuckolding him and then you need to take him to your old subject in Thailand and go this man's going to sort you out sort of thing yeah. Get, yeah and then and he can look through the A tape and the B tape and you know work out what works for him but, because that was another aspect of love that was quite interesting that kind of forced love mm. they were both in different kinds of forced love Remem remind me about what this was so this is one of my favourite ones and I think I say this the most where the guy is clearly a very angry Englishman who's gone to Thailand to find a wife. Lake Palmer. Lake Palmer was his name, yeah. He, I don't know if he was angry, but were, he, he, was, he, had, he definitely had psychological needs based <laughs> on having been an army veteran. He'd taken part right. in, a, in a military action in Aden, in, yeah. in whenever that was, when, mm -hmm. 60s, was it? 70s? Yeah. And, um, that left him quiet. And it left him scarred. And he had anger issues, it's fair to say, because I think he even says it to you, he's like, I, he need, I think he says in the document, I watched it this week, it is brilliant he he sort of goes yeah uh and you say well, physical sort of thing and you go no no just someone who has to be able to deal with my verbal abuse so he sort oh, of I've forgotten he said that so he sort of downgrades he goes oh, i don't hit them i just verbally abuse them right and there's a very awkward thing because you're in your more playful mode mm. and then at the end he's found his wife he's and got he, married and i think and I, there's a part of me that was like a did he get married to this thai woman because he wanted, to, he knew that would make him definitely be in the documentary, and it would make a great scene for the documentary. You know that whole idea of like, have we distorted reality by bringing in cameras? Right. And B, having therefore been played a role in putting them together, um, are we now responsible? or partly responsible if Lake chops his wife into little bits and hides her in the fridge. But that was quite funny as well because the documentary pretty much ends with him yeah. saying to her, she can barely understand what he's saying. Yeah, and her name he, was Jad. Jad, yeah. And Jad clearly didn't want to hold hands on the first date, clearly didn't want to do all these things. That and was he, a different date, I think. Yes. Yes, yeah. I don't think that was Jad. I think that was a different woman. I might be wrong. Maybe, but the point is at the end he goes, we are no longer two people. We are one. We are one. And, you, and in that moment, you want, you want to hear... Oh my God, I love you. That's fantastic. But she just goes, I understand. Right. And that for me was like one of them. It's the perfect end to the documentary because it shows so brilliantly. Right. That, that she didn't understand, if yeah. that makes sense. Look, I, you know, part of my job is to wrap my arms around things that may be counterintuitive or confusing or emotionally complicated. Right. And, and, um, Sometimes, you know, that's why my VO, I struggle to write like commentary and VO because I, I can't land, it's, you know, I try not to be judgmental. I can't always dictate like with polyamory specifically, like I was saying, that, that, that I can't, it's killing me that I can't remember his name, but th 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 what should happen there? God knows. Like the, neither of those alternatives is obviously perfect. Um, and in general, like polyamory, I'm sympathetic towards as an alternative you know as we live longer like when people got married i'm sure you know like people got married like the, the sacrament of marriage was instituted as a as a thing like at a time when people were lucky to live to 50 or 60 right so mm. you would marry and be married for 30 years now if you live to 80 or 90 you're married for 60 or 70 years not worth it good point and 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 actually you've got to Correct. find ways of like there's other there's myriad ways of arranging social affairs that are um that are just as valid as the ones we use the other thing is that term cuckold like I don't even, it's not one I hear very often except in a political setting. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you know, that term cucked, I don't know, is it okay to say cuckold or is that loaded now? What, what, what's it loaded with? Say well, anything you want. Well, no, I just no, I mention it because it's the idea of, I don't... Uh, well, I just, is it a derogatory Yeah, term? I just wonder yeah, if, like, is there a danger... Everything's like, to, offensive, Louis. Yeah, but in, the, in a sense, like, maybe I've already made this point, like, the idea... I. I, you know, I, I have to be careful not to become so open-minded my brains fall out, right? But the idea that, oh, you're less of a man because um, your wife is fucking some other guy. I think right. that's the point, I though, isn't saying. it? Quite that's what turns them on. Because cuckolding generally is a... I don't know if it, it might have been readopted by the polyamory community. Mm -hmm. I don't know. but Or is it a way of saying... Because there is no equivalent for women, right? Surely it's just the... 
Uh, so only men are cuckolded. Right. Uh, because like, it's seen as a taking away. Not, 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 I, I, I because a man's power is taken away. That. A man's that. power is taken away notionally uh, by a woman having sex with But a woman whose man is having an affair, there is no word for that. Because th- no, no be. shame yeah. technically attaches to uh, uh, a woman. She's just married to a guy who, who, who shags around. I've, I've, heard, I've heard of a woman enjoying that before. That's uh, a loaded story. <laughs> oh, enjoying what? Enjoying. Ah, it's a cuckoo. Uh, well, go. that's new, but that's yeah. a, that's a new that's a neologism, isn't it? Uh, I like, guess so. Where, yeah. where the guy fucks you know where a girl com- in front of his girlfriend and basically goes, "This is better than you," and that sort of thing. Right, yeah. that's become sort of a genre, I guess, yeah. in porn as well. Is like <laughs> everything's a genre in porn. Yeah, yeah. I think. I you know if there's a Louis Theroux porn. There, no, there definitely is. I mean, because with uh, it, you've got you, like a, a, a cult thing with women. Like, there's women out there who are mad for you. W- what about that? Because you surely know about this. The world's smallest subculture. Yeah. No, it, well, it, believe me, it isn't. No, it, if you had a convention of them, you'd have to book uh, a whole Pizza a Express. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Good show. Prince Andrew reference. Uh, I thought not. Yeah. Not the up. Not even the upstairs of a pub. No, no. You you have Big this pub. thing. The, the, this is the thing about you where. And um, you're, you know, you're a handsome guy. You, you have a, 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 a tall, dark, you know, thing going on. You got a good demeanor, very like respectful, uh, very approachable, and a lot of women just have a crush on you. It's yeah. nice to hear that. How do you handle? I don't that? hear that very often because my time of life. Well, when you got famous, surely there was a bit of a flood, uh, an avalanche, uh, maybe. You know, uh, I would say there was a small trickle. I was. Um, you Are we know, still talking about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm. I'm kind of constitutionally um, bound, m- monogamous. Like I. I don't do well. I don't find intimacy that easy. Like the whole. Yeah, we've seen that. Like the whole idea of um, one night stands. I always found quite weird. Like not weird as in I don't get it, but as in I don't know how you do that. Have you ever tried? I've tried, not that hard, but I have tried, yeah. Well, I, well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by not that hard, uh, Louis. Well, I, I've tried in my, year, in my sort of time, I haven't had, like, I've had long relationships. Okay. And then small sort of... Inter- Flings. Trists. Yeah, intermissions of, of bachelorhood. And, you know, you know, I've tried putting the moves. That sounds a bit weird. No. I've tried to basically... Um, yeah, play the field a bit, and um, what was I, the stopping point in your? Because it seems like there was something that you couldn't quite get to grips with there, mentally. Uh, don't mean physically. I'm sure everything was fine. Uh, I mean, clearly, don't I don't even know how to break it down. Like those times when I've tried, you know, those occasions when I've thought, um, "Are you on a date with a girl?" We? I'm trying to imagine the scenario here of what is why. Why you said you tried? I'm trying to think like um, like happen. either either. I think a lot of it happened. Um, in my early or mid twenties, at a point when either I wasn't famous or I was living in America, where I couldn't, my fame didn't mean anything. Surely, and being an English guy in America, though, that's, a, love, that's a winner. In New York, it didn't seem to work for me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not making it sound like I made repeated attempts. Like it just, I think at some level, I thought, you know, I used to smoke a lot of weed mm. at that time. That's good. And it? I'd be out like um, at a party or a club, and I'd be like. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good. Nice one. Have a few drinks. And then towards the end of the evening, Baked. I'd think, you know, I could try to see if I can, act, you know, want to go out. Can I get you? One of it was I didn't really want to play the long game. Like, hey, should we go out on a date? I just think, hey, do you want to come back? Maybe kick back and yeah. smoke some ganja. And, and if that didn't go, then I'd be like, you know, I, I'm quite, I'd like to go back and just just blaze a J and just um, have another like have another glass of wine smoke a spliff and watch some TV or, or you don't want the hassle of the awkwardness yeah I yeah. just thought you know what I'm a what little a bit tired I, I feel like I know that I can go home and ha- have a, a spliff and, and read the New York Review of Books and, and, and put some music on and get high and listen to some music and that would, would seem much more appealing probably that kind not of shows that. where you're at yeah, does that mean it, it, does that, is that, am I making no any, I get what you mean though because a new person sense. there's always that sort of nervous energy of is this what you want what do you like like you have to break all of those things and with someone like yourself who just kind of wants that comfortable feeling of a night aim as you're describing yeah. 
that's sort of a bit much in it yeah, there's a new energy you don't quite know and I think where's it going to lead where, where yeah. does it go pressure yeah awkwardness yeah. but everything else in your career has been partly about you sort of you know uh, not that your love life is your career but in the rest of your life you do see sometimes leave things down to serendipity and you are quite willing to go with serendipity so that's quite interesting to see you're not willing to do that in your love life so well I wonder if um, I wonder if one of the reasons that I do the work that I do is because I um it gives me the license or even the incentive to to get out of my comfort zone in a in a you know to explore aspects of life that if in my normal life I would just be too passive and that's what's the brilliance right. of when I watch you is this is clearly a man who look if you put me in that massage uh position with that girl I'm confident I'm happy I'm laughing probably grabbing something the camera yeah. leaves the room but, we uh, don't know where uh, it goes exactly right. um, I'm going to adapt to it in a different way but because that is clearly <laughs> not what you want to do mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it is is so funny and entertaining and and also endearing well that's nice of you to say like, I think a lot a lot of my life is governed by anxiety and 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 and, and I think with, with and, and with that goes a certain work ethic mm. like I assuage feelings of anxiety by trying to work hard and be praised and feel good about um, doing work and feeling as though you know it's like delivering on a deadline or handing in your homework or whatever. You, you get that feeling like Oh, I've done the what relief. I'm supposed That's to do. That's quite puritanical, almost. Yeah, I'm probably I I would plead guilty to being somewhat puritanical, and 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 then so in a setting where um anxiety like there's no work ethic that impels you to try and go out and meet someone and take them home, right? That 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 all I hear what I'm mainly getting from that is a feeling of anxiety. Yeah, and and, and, the, and where's the payoff? And 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 and, and a sort of sense of yeah, a payoff of, of possibly further anxiety yeah. and. <laughs> And, is that and, why the ganja came in handy? Right. Uh, it was sort of why I stopped smoking ganja, if anything. Really? Yeah, yeah, I would, I mean, I would, I would, um, I, I, in those days, I would basically have a few glasses of wine and then that would take the edge off the anxiety and then have a spliff and then I'd just be sort of almost, I mean, what, you're just on this sort of cloud of... You're floating. Yeah, you're floating. Yeah. I remember sometimes lying in bed and feeling like the Ready Brett kid. Do you know what I mean? Where you, you're kind of glowing, right? Yeah. And you like, and, and it feels, oh, this is nice. So how did you stop then? If it, felt, it feels so good. Well, when I met my wife, oh, um, she wasn't as big a fan of of ganj, <laughs> of split. not as big a fan. Even the right way, like, yeah. yeah, of, of smoking. Well, there's a compromise meat. you did make. Yeah, and 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 actually, it doesn't yeah. really work if one of you is doing it. Yeah, and the other isn't. Yeah, you're just wasted getting the munchies on the couch, and she's like, "Well, we've got washing up to do." Yeah, yeah. come on now. Pretty much put the kids to bed. I mean, I would like to see it legalized. It. I would like to. I, it was one of those things. Like as I drink less, I have ramped down post pandemic, if we are post pandemic, uh, and um, I, if I don't keep bullet bourbon in the house, I find things go a lot more smoothly. Right, mm. like I just have a couple of glasses of wine or whatever. But but now that um. I would love it if they legalize it. In California, where I've lived, it's legal. It's so civilized. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you just, um, you know, you vape it or you do whatever and it feels as though it's just the way things should be, right? There isn't this desperate kind of, like on nights out, people don't get annihilated at the pub, right? There mm -hmm. isn't that feeling of um, must get blotto. No, people know? don't get violent on weed. The, the health ramifications are nowhere near as yeah. bad as alcohol or tobacco. It will happen. Uh, it's just happening so slowly. Oh, we're waiting forever in this country. Yeah. And guess what? We've just spent so much money on a track and trace system that doesn't even fucking work. And you've got something there that we could have manufactured that would inject so much money into the economy immediately. And yet we're not pressing that button purely because alcohol companies decades ago waged a war against it to try and preserve their own, you know, businesses coming. Uh, in money. Invest in it. Presumably they're still lobbying against it. Aren't they? Medicine companies will be as well. Sleeping tablet companies, all of them. And I get it, but it's frustrating. Because Are they also prepping? to get to for when it does happen they know. need to get the infrastructure I, I in place sort of it, it, what are they waiting for bloody hell we need money I suppose the problem is they're all sitting around smoking weed so no one's getting anything done nah, they're doing lines that's in parliament mate. Right, that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the other stuff that they like that's, it's quite interesting to hear you say that though because obviously you're a sort of a BBC lifer um, if you like you're one of those people who's worked with the BBC for majority of your career but you're very un-BBC at the same time well I'm, I, my relationship with the BBC has changed first of all I didn't come into the BBC as a BBC animal, I, I was hired by Michael Moore as a writer and presenter on TV Nation, which was, although it was on BBC Two, like it was a New York-based 
independent production made by his production company. Of course, you were the intern in the office that did all the photocopies. Well, he said that, yeah. <laughs> he, got, he misremembered it. I'm very grateful. Shout out to Michael Moore for kind of giving me, like without him, nothing that, ever, that subsequently happened for my career would have happened. And, and I, so I have, to, I have to thank him for that. And, and then I, I was always semi-detached from the BBC in that sense. And, 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 I think came, and then even once I came back to the UK, first series of Weird Weekends was made in New York. Then we were outside, even though we were a, a BBC production, we were based outside the BBC for the most part. And now one of the things that happened two years ago was from being in-house BBC Studios production, we start producing. Now we produce programs with our own company, Mindhouse. Mm. So, which is you and your wife. Which is me and my wife. Mm. And we also make programs that aren't for the BBC. But I do think the BBC was extraordinary. I mean, I think I am BBC in the sense that um, I think the BBC has this, uh, bec- I think because of its position in our culture, it's got the kind of, the, 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 almost the confidence to uh, just give latitude to people that someone in the BBC believes in. They go like, you know, famously Monty Python, right? The famous stories, like they went into some commissioner and said, oh, we're a couple of funny guys, you know, a few funny, and they were like, okay, well, we're only commissioning one series, you know, it's like based on almost nothing. And then, you know, and that's, how, who else would have commissioned, like, how, how would you even have pitched Monty Python? And for us, for me, like, they've, for years and years, when I was in house, I just had a rolling commission. They're like, they, I work contract to contract. Ten, they they say, make okay, make ten more, and that was what it was like. Make ten more documentaries, and then whatever, more or less, whatever I fancied doing. It's extraordinary in a way. Like we've talked a lot about a place for paedophiles. I find it hard to imagine any other broadcasting outfit in the world that would have said, "Hey, let's send this guy to spend two weeks at a maximum security of." Uh, hospital for for paedophiles very similar to working at the BBC at one point <laughs> it's a joke sorry and just ch- and just see what you see what happens right or let's go to San Quentin or in 2003 strange, I said like, I want to go and spend time with neo-nazis for six months yeah. very similar to no there was no, no pay no but that, that's um, <laughs> sorry that, that, no but it's strange for me because in the dealings that people I know of I think the BBC, the BBC gets a bad rap on Savile and the paedophile yeah. I, anyway. I agree and sorry about that no we'll, t- we'll talk about it at some point anyway but uh, it, it's the fact that the BBC are so um, safety first generally in so many different things I know you work with them a little bit uh, and just what I've heard and then yet yeah, with you they had so much trust yeah uh, I wonder how you felt about that and how you managed Isn't to it? get that trust really Compared well, the first thing else. I'm thinking about is the, it was, one of the odd things was when I delivered the program, um, I thought, God, no, this is nothing like this has ever been on TV. You know, uh, it, this is extraordinary. Like there's 700 of the most dangerous sex offenders anywhere in California, all housed in one building. And they're playing squash and playing in jazz combos. Right. And, and doing finger painting to talk about their feelings. It was just whatever, you know, the moral dimensions of what you think about that, that's just an extraordinary thing to get access to. No other TV crew had ever been there. And um, and I remember what came back from the channel at that time was a feeling of like, yeah, Louis getting a bit dark. Like, you know, what about another program about something that was more like when Louis met the Hamiltons you know and and, and, you know they've done so much for me the BBC's I hate to sort of like do anything that implies criticism but but I do remember thinking like well that's quite odd like I thought they'd be going like oh my god that was amazing but you know I realized my sensibility isn't for everyone and and that's part of I suppose what makes it special in terms of the um the trust I think I get a lot of latitude just but just from a track record of, of delivering ratings and good reviews right and, and the, yeah and, and to go with that you've probably also got a team of people behind the camera who obviously aren't you and they are yeah. you know they're your counterbalance if you like and I think a lot of, you do sort of reference that in your book where you say you know uh, like for instance when there was an inquiry at the BBC you get hauled in front of the inquiry but your director your exec producer and none of the other people are involved in it do that's right and they could have just as valuable or information as you do if yeah. not more valuable I found that really odd actually yeah was that because you're the face of the operation that was thing, the Savile right? inquiry the Dame Janet Smith Savile inquiry okay okay so I was just going to nip the toilet can I nip the no, toilet nip to the loo time? and then we'll are, we okay? are you okay for time uh, how, how much longer so you got keep what, you. another 15 cool Perfect. I'll yeah. be right. let him piss really quick um, yeah I found that and, and I know obviously you're quite reticent in a way to talk about Savile because you've been clipped up so much and I know, you know... I, I mean, I don't... I, if I'm asked about him, I always, um, you know, I'm always up for answering questions. Yeah, I just didn't want to put you in a difficult position because I, I also get... It's, 
it's kind of it's kind of something that people know you for but not in a um a lot of people haven't really properly read into it and i and even well i, I think here's what happens is that um uh it's such a sort of clickbait topic and i think anyone who speaks up ends up almost it's almost like you're tacitly saying okay i'll be the face of this subject i'll be the point person for this subject but there's myriad people who had closer involvement with him right who had um you know and i think the bb one of the reasons the bbc i mean clearly the bbc didn't make him famous because he was famous from pirate radio but elevated him to stratospheric levels of fame and to a different level yeah i think uh, most of his offenses uh, if you if you read the documents took place in hospitals like there were offenses in the dressing rooms of top of the pops and elsewhere on bbc premises but um by far the the largest number of offenses took place at leeds general infirmary in stoke mandeville, and, stoke mandeville. Yeah. and yet somehow the bbc gets more of a rap than the nhs when actually you could plausibly make a case that it was an NHS failure. Maybe don't point that out because the Daily Mail's waiting for both of them to kind of yeah. trip up in that sense. That's a bit worrying. Well, I mean, it's. I, I want the honest truth of what you. You know how you said that you felt like the BBC got a bad rap. Is yeah. that is that sort of what you're saying here? Is, I think they've been. I think it's because there was a miss uh, on I, a lot of no, people. There's no question there were huge failings, and the you know, and I, I, I anyone who's really interested in this, <clears throat> I recommend that they read um, the Janet Smith inquiry. These uh, findings which is quite a long document, but at least have a flick through. They're all downloadable mm. on the internet. And also, if you're feeling sort of um, masochistic, like, uh, or just genuinely kind of curious in a macabre way about what happened, the, the Leeds General Infirmary Inquiry and the, um, the, the Broadmoor Inquiry and, and the Stoke Mandeville Inquiry, every hospital, every school... Uh, had to launch a, a an inquiry and publish its findings online, and these are all freely available. Mm. And um, and what you so so clearly the the, the failings were vast across the board. He, um, he was given free reign of hospitals, more or less wandering the corridors in in a white coat, Jesus. sort of passing himself off as a as a doctor. Um, uh, at the BBC. They obviously weren't observing, you know, what were supposed to be the protocols, which was that no one under, I think, 16 was allowed backstage. And um, and and so on their watch, they carry that happened on their watch. And so th those in charge carry the can for that. But and that's yeah. that, and, as it, and it was it, it was it was some of the footage as well, where you see him groping kids in front of the camera as well or inappropriately sort of the way he'd hold them. And it's disgusting. But uh, I was wondering why you initially asked the question to him are you a paedophile like wh wh what what information did you have like i know there was rumors but what what made you think you know what because i've heard this that's why i'm going to ask him okay so the first thing to say is that the reason i think just to take one example on the bad rap question like it's sometimes insinuated that oh when louis made his program about jimmy savile he he must have been told like he's a national treasure and we don't want it getting awkward like just bear in mind don't go too near the questions about uh -huh. um, whether he's a pedophile or anything nothing like that ever happened in fact if anything the reverse he was a he was a risible figure at that point he uh -huh. you know alternative comedy had come and gone he jim will fix it had been off the air uh, you know, you know, in, and I mentioned that in the sense that you know, it was a new landscape of television making in which people like Jimmy Savile were seen as superannuated and irrelevant mm. and, and hopeless. He was known to be a supporter of Margaret Thatcher. Anyone in media tended to view him as a total dinosaur, right? He wasn't and a weirdo, and, and a weirdo, and, yeah. and, and he'd been on Jim Fix It, and he hadn't, um, he had he hadn't been on Radio One for many years, and and so he was he was retired, irrelevant, desperately trying to get headlines by doing random stunts, um, on uh, and and sort of generating some I, sort of publicity. I for thought himself. that's why he loved being around you because so when someone I was called, giving him any yeah, attention so when at we, all. So 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 uh, I I and the re so the the genesis of the project was I was sitting around with a bunch of people of similar age talking about Jim will fix it and it was like everyone at the table was like oh yeah I wrote in I wrote in I, I said I'd written in um, and I sort of realized what a kind of level of cultural cachet or at least a, sort of 
just how many people had memories of him and, and, and it was like yeah he's quite odd wasn't he and I went back and talked to my series producer David Mortimer and said you know what about like a because we'd been thinking about a single profile we talked about doing Lemmy oddly enough and Bernard Manning it was like yeah, who is there a single person who you could spend a lot of time with and then they'd, they'd be so intriguing and odd that you could sort of go on a journey trying to figure them out and we're like, what about Jimmy Savile for this thing we've been talking about? And he's like, yeah, 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 he's really weird. He's got, do you know, he's got a cell at Stoke Mandeville where he spends time and, uh, or maybe he said at Broadmoor. That's right. He said he's got a cell at Broadmoor and he keeps his, his mother's um, clothes in a closet and he gets them dry cleaned once a year as a sort of remembrance of her, calls her the Duchess. And, and I was like, oh yeah. And of course there's all the rumors about him being a pedophile or even a necrophile. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and just, so just to reflect, the fact that for me that was just general knowledge like that was just that wasn't like media gossip mm. that was something I'd heard when I'd been sort of 14 or 15 years old and I never remember anyone ever saying um oh uh, wait wait Jimmy Savile's supposed to be a pedophile like I've never heard that right you know when I um when I uh when I went to make the program, it wasn't my aim to like unmask him. I didn't believe him to be a pedophile. I thought that um, it was just yes, yeah. I thought it was just something that gets passed around, like you know, like people talk about r- this actor uh, yeah. put a gerbil up his bum, mm. right? <laughs> and, and, He's a good actor. And good old to, Richard. Gere. To, all right. No, well, yeah. are you allowed to say? No, that? but do you know the funny thing about it is, no, we're coming back to your old series. The guy in the brothel who thought he was like Richard Gere and Pretty Woman. Right. Hilarious. Anyway, sorry. It's very different. <laughs> Richard yeah, Gere no and, and, and took out an ad saying he hadn't done anything like that, which I believe, right? I don't think he put a <laughs> gerbil up his bum. And I approve this message. Yeah. Um, I don't think he did either. And Rod Stewart, when I was growing up, they used to say Rod Stewart collapsed on his way to a gig and was taken to hospital where they pumped his stomach and found the sp- eight pints of sperm, sperm belonging to like 15 different men, right? Who tested that, you know? Yeah. I know. It's, yeah. like, oh, it's a sticky another, substance. Another, could another one. Yeah. Here's the thing. And by the way, and I heard that also about Mark Armand. Yeah. I have heard that about other people. I remember being told that, Ro- um, that, that uh, Mick Jagger used to like passing a pint glass around and getting everyone like in his entourage to spit in it and then he'd drink it. Right. I mean, there's bound to be some stories about Cliff Richard as well. He's another another one, one was he was very he's a he's a famous you know rock I'm, star, ambiguous guy. Yeah. Um, so basically, my point is, is these things get passed around, and you think like, no, I I don't think that happened, but it's a funny story, uh-huh. and that's kind of where you settle. I think in uh, your retelling, or you know, you're kind of um, documenting of it all. When I documented it, what happened was I uh, I didn't think um, he was probably a paedophile. You know, I didn't completely rule it out, but I did think there's something mysterious uh, about his love life. Like I was like, who, who, who is Jimmy Savile in the in the sort of sexual sense? Like, mm-hmm. what's his orientation? I thought maybe he's gay. I actually thought maybe he's celibate. Like maybe he's just like one of these people who's like, oh, I don't like sex doesn't do anything mm-hmm. for me. Right. And then I, wrong. when I um when I talked to him about it, he said, I've got lots of girlfriends, but friends who are girls. No, I haven't got any of those. So he was suggesting he was like a kind of <laughs> a like free bird, a player, a, dr- a, a drifter. We would go from woman to woman, but with no, you know, wherever I, what is it? Lay, wherever I lay my hat, lay that's my, my hat, bone yeah, kind of storm. thing. But that was kind of, that kind of went with the misdirection element. Of well, it, then I thought like, um, that doesn't sound very plausible because like who would cop off with Jimmy Savile? Like he doesn't have the, the air of a Don Juan. He just isn't attractive enough. Mm. Um, so I thought, well, I don't really know what the deal is. But I, I mean, the only credit I can give myself is that I was conscious of not having solved. I knew there was a riddle and I, and I knew I hadn't solved it. You know, in a sense, like I found the dimensions of the problem, mm. but I didn't sort of figure out exactly what the you, solution was. You put was. the question to him and it is an interviewer. That's all you can ever do. And I don't think you should be beating yourself up about it. But it did feel like when I watched you coming back and talking to the victims, I said earlier that you hadn't been that emotional, Mm -hmm. but there was one moment where you were talking to one of his victims and I seen you, you you were talking about how you felt like maybe you hadn't done your best or could have done better or whatever. And she was empathizing with you and, and, I could feel like you sort of lost your voice for a second there. Possibly, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a, it was probably the most stressful, certainly the most stressful, and maybe the most emotional program I've made. Because you know, it's easy to not be emotional in in, in situations where you don't feel in any way connected, emotionally invested, or, mm. or 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 in a sense that you have no responsibility. Like, if someone's in prison, 
um, for murder or in a ho- hospital, mental hospital for, you know, um, abusing children. Like that's on one level horrendous, but I've got no, I got nothing to do with that. Like that didn't happen. I had nothing, nothing to do with, uh-huh. I was a thousand miles away. But with Savile, there was a feeling like, oh, I had an opportunity to maybe, I was thinking like, did I have an opportunity to do more? And actually, and what part of me, and the other, and I, the other thing is like this sort of feeling of, um, of, 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 oh, I, and I, st- I, I actually started to quite like him. Like, the word friend doesn't really cover it, but I had friendly feelings towards him. Well, you've given you great visit. content in your head, so you're always going to be For appreciative sure, but also... You're to come visit him, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I talk in my book about... And in a way, the program speaks for itself. I'm proud of it, and it still stands up, although it's hard to find on the internet. But um, uh, what happened afterwards was that I went to visit him a few times on these sort of ambiguous... Um, uh, outings where it would be like, oh, he's going to do some publicity for a DVD that we've got coming out, or there would be so it would be semi-professional, but then there was a friendly element of it where um, I would uh, we'd go to a local restaurant. Me and my director of the original doc would stay overnight at his place. So there was a part of me that that that, that felt oh the line got blurred a bit, and 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 I sort of viewed him as as a kind of as a person I had friendly feelings towards, and that so that was the part I found more difficult. Uh, to process was just the idea that oh wow and when the when the first allegations came out I just noticed in me a, 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 a part of me thinking like oh it can't be as bad as that can it do you know what I mean like mm-hmm. and I and then I had as it became clear that it was there, there was a kind of a guilt and a feeling of guilt yeah can you can you describe that moment of when the penny dropped of how serious and in that maybe I don't know you're hearing it on the news and you're sitting down thinking wow a guy who I thought was a friend or had friendly feelings towards was horrific and like what was the dawning feeling uh, well i can yeah obviously it's it's, it's a process right mm. and 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 what came first was mark williams thomas and the exposure report on itv then there was a panorama that was also very powerful uh there were various news segments but for me it didn't really fully hit home in the in in, in, in the sense i i got the what was the most kind of revelatory moment of the level of his offending was reading the um, Leeds General Infirmary report, mm. and 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 uh, you can't really do justice to it on television or because uh, you know that people are anonymized or they have one or two, but there's an accumulation of detail because there's something like fifty or sixty victims all listed, and you know not all of it. You know, some of it is rape, or uh, some of it is sort of. Um, I mean, there's a, what I'm saying is there's a whole range of offences, um, uh, but because of the accumulation of detail and because the, the victims aren't named, they obviously feel they can sort of deliver their testimony without fear of... Um, Reprisal. Really, a sort of sense of self-consciousness. Mm. And, um, and you read it and it's a one after another and then you rec- in recognising little parts of uh, either phrases or, or just sort of seeing him in your head as you read it, it mm. it's a very powerful and upsetting... Um, For that, you more than it a was. lot of people, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure, yeah, absolutely. And then when I made the, the Savile follow-up, uh-huh. I made it my practice to sort of read through the reports right. any time I was about to go and meet a victim, mm. just to keep it present, just to keep the level of... the, the realness, the rawness of, of, of the offences in mind. Um, so obviously there was a failure on a lot of people's part mm-hmm. uh, to bring him to justice in, in his life, um, people were let down. But the, there's also a lot of people who think there was a cover-up, a deliberate cover-up, because of his relationships with certain high figures in society mm-hmm. and the, the positions he held. What do you think of the rumour or the speculation that he was supplying children to certain people in power as a way of keeping himself in the clear, similar to Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein did? Uh I would I don't I wouldn't believe that. Mm. I, I tend to think that if you look at his offence history and also his personality profile in general, mm. he was very much a loner. Uh he he was someone who almost prided himself. Like he was he, he, he was it's intriguing actually because he was connected to power in certain respects, but very much on his own terms. So he was famously a kind of a confidant to um Prince Charles and and was friendly with Princess Diana. That's where the speculation, right? Was and from. he was, you yeah. know, spent a Christmas at Checkers, 
but that weren't those weren't really the circles that he moved in like based on what i saw he prided himself on surrounding himself with people who were not in show business mm. who were uh sort of just salt of the earth types mm. who were from leeds like his hairdresser the bloke who lived downstairs from him um local just local characters of a very unstarry sort and when you read like the the offenses <coughs> took place not in a sort of Epstein, you know, the Epstein MO seems to have been get them to his house, get them to his mansion, mm. get them to his island, groom them over a period of weeks, months, traffic them, get other people More to his island. More of an operation rather than It's a than whole a outfit. And he had outriders like, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell and yeah. others. You know, he had a, a, he had a crew of people mm. who were m more or less running his, you know, or at least involved in his... Um, his operation with with if Jimmy Savile's offences took place in in hospital um, corridors or in hosp on on the spur of the moment sort of thing yeah or most speed of the grooming as you yeah I call it. it I mean it's the thing is he didn't generally uh, for, I mean the thing is his offence history was so vast and kind of various that no generalisation completely applies but most I would say of his offences took place uh, as it were on the spur of the moment in a moment of, if I put my hand here, can I get away with it? If I grope here, can I get away with it? And then testing the limits. Or if mm. I hug, what happens if I stick my tongue in this person's mouth? Or what happens if, you know, I drop, you know, this optician's coming around to deliver glasses. What's going to happen if I drop and my you, trousers? And we've seen that in your documentary and how he would test the limits yeah. around people in the office when he was getting undressed and stuff. like. Yeah. But yeah. also because his personality, I think she says that the optician who went to his house, she says that was turned into a funny story in her life. Well, initially because, she wasn't traumatized. I mean, right. I mean, it's up for, it's to, for her to say whether she was traumatized or not, but the impression she gave was of not having been traumatized by it initially. Although some, you know, people process experiences in different ways. I mean, the other thing is like, then he, there's another woman who was at the end of the film who talks about um, having been assaulted uh, in some area of a church close to Stoke Mandeville over various occasions, who in a, in a sense, I suppose she was groomed in that it took place over some time. Mm -hmm. But even there, he's not bringing her back to his place. He's obviously opportunistically mm -hmm. finding a, a, a private setting where he thinks he'll be unseen and will have a few moments to get his, you know, his kicks by abusing her. Did so, so, so to me, just so it doesn't really to me make any sense that he would deliver children, well, the, have the children reason, moving the, around. The, I, the reason I understand is a lot of people were like, "Why is a guy who is a crappy radio DJ who isn't powerful, is hasn't got a lot of sway and influence, have a lot more money than he should have, have this social status of a charity guy? Then he's knocking around with the royals. What are the royals want? Well, to I do? can answer and, that, and that's sort of the, that's the speculation. And right. I get it. I, I kind of get what they're on about, but. He, he, first of all, he didn't really have that much money. Mm. Uh, that was one of the myths he created. He'd get a new Rolls every year sent to him mm. and he'd trade in the old one. He had, he had properties. He wasn't, like, he, his, his brand, he was a bit like a rapper. Like his brand was that he was really rich and, and he would give that impression, but that was part of his celebrity persona. I mean, I'm not saying he was hurting for money, but like he wasn't like, you know, like he was, had about as much money as a kind of average business person do you know mm -hmm. what i mean and um with respect to uh he he, he wasn't a, also wasn't a crappy dj like he was quite an accomplished dj like he, uh, he's one of the things that's happened in retrospect is like because his offense history was horrendous like it's like it's almost like everything about him has to be awful mm -hmm. like he was actually an accomplished uh, broadcaster broadcaster he was i've seen him deliver uh, pieces to camera on the spur of the moment without any pause without any repeat like in a single take perfectly to time that's not an easy thing to do and quite evidently like to, to run a successful family show like Jim will fix it as a presenter for more than 10 years with huge ratings like th that's not a trivial achievement mm -hmm. um, so and the idea of his influence was his, what he did have because he had no family and because he had uh, um, you know predatory sexual interests and maybe even for other reasons as well like he dedicated himself to charity mm -hmm. so through his leveraging his charity uh, work which was you know considerable and raising millions thereby he got the ears of people in power 
And, uh, you know, if you say I've just raised 20 million or whatever to build a new wing of a hospital, then in general, like someone powerful will show up to cut the ribbon, right? That's quite manipulative, though, from his pers- well, of from course, our perspective. Yeah, as it turns it? out, like that was a part of his offense did, uh, practices, did, right? Did, can I ask you, because that's what I was curious about. Did you feel manipulated by him? Because there was a point where I was reading a book where I did feel a bit like he would have the, he'd have your phone number and he'd call you and he would sort of, he'd take credit for little things. There were very, there was a lot of manipulation or attempts at manipulation uh, towards you, I felt, in hearing of what Of course, in, in yeah, I mean, I, I, was mon- well, I was one of many people. I mean, I would say anyone who we imagined was um, powerful or had something that he thought might be helpful to him, he would attempt to manipulate, mm. right? I mean, that was his- That was his thing. That was M-O. his entire MO. And occasionally I'd be surprised, like I'd think of him as quite a friendly person and, um, and accommodating. And like, I, one of the things I liked about him was that he was unfussy, right? He, was, he, he wasn't diva-ish in the mm-hmm. least, right? He was actually, so for example, on location, my director accidentally broke one of the windows of his house and he just laughed about it. Mm-hmm. Or we also accidentally broadcast his address, which is a big no-no in, mm-hmm. um, you know, in TV terms. Like he, he, he's a celebrity, he shouldn't have his address put out on TV. That should have been blurred um, because it was in shot. And, and he, did, he just laughed about it. And I thought, good on him. Like, you know, he, he actually, he could have thrown a fit or been upset and uptight. As many other, like Max Clifford, for example, was difficult. You know, he didn't like the documentary. He kicked up a fuss. He got annoyed. He sort of vowed revenge. Jimmy Savile was like, oh, no, it's a good program. I'm liking it. What do you need from me in the way of publicity? And then in hindsight, you realize, oh, all of these are ways of ingratiating himself and ways to create a feeling of indebtedness Mm -hmm. that then builds uh, a kind of gratitude and a trust and a sort of sense of goodwill. So that was his whole MO. And it was, you know, obviously very effective. I wish we had longer because it sort of opens Dude, up. Dude, we'll do another one. I'd love to, because it, it does open up that whole other conversation about, we, we have a, a lot of conspiracy theorists on, and I'd love to have heard your opinion about people Well, like I'd love David to talk Icke about and, that. I do think that like, that what you mentioned, Brian, about the, you know, was he trafficking? Like, I'm, I think the, the world of um, pedophiles and sex rings, you know, is real. Like those things exist, mm. but they don't exist in quite the way um, that is maybe commonly understood in in the sort of the world of internet conspiracy theories, and I think it's a it's a it's a big deal because obviously QAnon has got so much traction, and it shows a rather I think naive understanding of how um, how trafficking takes place. I've made a program about tra- trafficking in Houston, how sexual abuse takes place, mm-hmm. and and the ways in which it does flourish, but 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 not quite in in in, in the sort of in the QAnon mode that is kind of where i'd love to unpack like the fact you've pr- promised us another podcast now is uh, i mean that's contractual Can we get a signature yeah um that is contractual you are uh, gonna have nice. to come back <laughs> nice. yeah. uh, I'll, I'll get, let's got, see what the headlines are like on this one yeah we'll go with it oh they'll be fucking great Let, just remember me. true geordie podcast if you could get that in if the daily mail always seem to take the quote but they never seem but ne- to put the link there's going to the gonna be there's going to be dilemma it's like well we've we we normally would go with the um i was friends with jimmy savile headline but but we've also got the like i was on the edge of having a drinking problem I do yeah. like that. I do like the that. The drinking problem one's good because I feel it humanizes you a bit. Yeah. I, I think you should go down that Shouting route. Shouting at the kids as well. Abusive yeah. dad. Yeah, maybe. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um. And I'm sure you're thrilled to hear us <laughs> just joking about it's that at this point. The it's all in the, the keyhole. It's all in the book. Through the keyhole. And um. more. I was very struck, by the way, at how candid you are in your book. My, I did my, my wife best. and I have sort of enjoyed, we've enjoyed how candid you were because it normalizes some of my awful behavior. Mm. Nice to hear Thank that. Thank you for that. Nice to hear that. Be the best person you can. Be the best dad that you can. But if you can't drink, Bourbon. Well, I wasn't going to go <laughs> Sorry. there. Uh, one, one more question before you go. Yes. Please. How would you like to be remembered? Oh. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, I normally have a, a, have a joke for that, which I'm not even going to... You know, the joke is obviously like, oh, he, you know, he, he died having sex in the arms of his beautiful wife, Nancy, on holiday in Crete, Ooh. you know, celebrating that he'd received... His long-awaited Nobel Prize mm-hmm. that he'd rejected. I he'd honestly rejected wondered what you were earlier. what you were going to receive. Yeah. Then that was yeah. Uh, uh, but you know, I would like to be remembered. You know, the 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 most important people in my life, obviously, my family, my kids. I'd like to be remembered by them, like as a, a you know, my, my wife will outlive me, I'm sure. 
you know, as a, as a like a guy who didn't always shout at his kids, like who was actually a considerate, loving dad. Like mm-hmm. I've got three boys. Families, as they get older, they don't get simpler. They get more complicated. Mm-hmm. I see families, people close to me, they get estranged from one another. They fall out. If you can keep your relationship with your kids as you get older, and and just be loved and remembered by them as someone who who was a present dad, a loving father, someone who gave them the best start in life, a loving husband, who who was. Um, you know who who you spent. You know, I'm thinking about my wife now. Who who you, you enjoyed spending time with. You know, like these are the simple things, but they're also the big things. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful, ladies and gentlemen, Louis Theroux Thank on the you. True Jordy podcast. Great no, we, one. Thank, thank you very much. Like the video, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>